Whoa, yes. This meeting is now in session. Will you all please rise for the presentation of the colors by the Career Center, Air Force, JROTC. Please be seated. Welcome, everyone. Tonight, we have a recognition. It's a student showcase of our Best Buddies program. Paul Jamalski, Director of Special Education, will introduce this special recognition. Mr. Jamalski. Thank you. Good evening, Madam Chair, school board members, and Dr. Murphy. Um, it is my pleasure this evening to showcase uh, several student groups that we have in, um, in Arlington Public Schools. The Best Buddies program has grown out of advocacy, a history of advocacy and inclusion efforts going back many years. In 1989, Best Buddies became um, uh, the first uh, national unified social and recreational program for people with intellectual disabilities. Um, Best Buddies has expanded to an international organization with high school and middle school chapters in more than 50 countries. The mission of Best Buddies operates on three pillars, one-to-one -one friendships, integrated employment, and leadership development. One of the largest regional events in the United States for Best Buddies is coming up this weekend with the Capital Region Best Buddies Friendship Walk on Saturday, October 21st. Best Buddies describes this event as follows. Uh, the Best Buddies Friendship Walk Capital uh, Region is a powerful social movement that supports inclusion and acceptance for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Open to all ages and athletic abilities, the Capital Region Walk has the energy of a big family gathering as more than 2,000 Best Buddies program participants with and without intellectual disabilities walk side by side to promote friendship and community inclusion. We are proud of the Best Buddies chapters in Arlington um, as part of the Capital Region Best Buddies. Wakefield, Washington Lee, and Yorktown all have Best Buddies chapters, and the HB Woodlawn and Stratford programs have had the Stratford Friends program in place for many years that functions very much like the Best Buddies program. This year, Gunston Middle School launched a Best Buddies chapter, and now all five middle schools in Arlington participate with Best Buddies. I would like to welcome some of our Best Buddies and Stratford Friends participants who are able to join us this evening, as well as we have two representatives from um, uh, the Best Buddies uh, national uh, group um, and international group. We have Rachel Letters from the National Capital Region 
And we have Alexandra Spatova from Best Buddies Russia, who is working with um, an exchange with uh, the American Best Buddies group, and they are working together for the walk that is going to be going on. We have several different representatives, and um, I would invite um, some of the uh, student representatives from our uh, different high schools and high school programs to be able to come up. Uh, several of our students uh, would like to share a few words with uh, the board and with the community. And I can recognize from HB Woodlawn, our, one of our staff sponsors, um, Phyllis Thompson and Daphne Nance, were not able to be here this evening. But we have several students, in, including Carolyn Kassir and um, uh, Sahar Hamam and Shannon Lucius. Um, and uh, Carolyn, Sahar, and Shannon, if you'd like to uh, be able to stand up and be recognized, and you're welcome to be able to come and uh, share a few words if you would like. Hi, just to reintroduce myself, I'm Caroline Kassir. Um, at HB, per usual, we do things a little bit differently. Um, instead of being run by a teacher or best buddies, our Stratford Friends program works through a board of five chairs. So there's me, two other seniors, and two juniors who try to facilitate all that's happening um, while working with Phyllis and Daphne in Stratford. Being co-located, um, at the Stratford site has been really important and really helpful for us in that we get to have a lot of daily interaction. The way our program works, the foundation of our program, is every Wednesday at the end of the school day, um, the HB kids go down to their assigned room and hang out with Stratford friends. There are a lot of fun things. It's, some of it's helping kids pack up at the end of the day um, or doing crafts when they're doing crafts. We have a lot of dance parties, I don't, Shannon. Um, can do a mean let it go, if y'all ever want to stop by. <laughs> um, we also get to do a lot of integrated activities with them, and we're working to do even more. We have a turkey bowl that they come and um, help cheer on. They have a Halloween activity block tomorrow that I'm coming to and very excited about. Um, there will be cookies, there will be crafts, there will be decorating, it will be great. That we also get to help them um, put on their prom and their graduation, which is always really fun. This morning, actually, that picture, um, uh, the Wilson site, I was there with my choir, and a couple of our Stratford students were also there to speak along with our HB students, which I think really just shows how much we are so important to each other. Um, and I want to take a moment to thank you all for letting us stay together throughout all the moving and shifting that's been happening in Arlington. Um, because I think it's really important. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Caroline, Sahar, and Shannon. We have our Washington Lee Best Buddies group, our uh, staff sponsors for the group, Ms. Uh, Jermosen Hill and Ms. Andresco, were not able to be here this evening, but we have our president, Essie Wonderman, and we have student buddy director, William Brenneman. My name is Essie Wonderman, kind of short, um, and I'm the president of Best Buddies at Washington Lee. Um, I'm a senior now, but I still remember being kind of a scared, lost freshman, floundering around WNL, um, and I was like that until I found Best Buddies, and that's when I really found my niche. Um, I remember looking at all of the upperclassmen officers and being so jealous of how poised and composed and passionate they were. Um, and now I've grown into my own kind of leader. I'm definitely not poised all the time. I'm definitely make lots of mistakes, but I feel so supported by this huge family um, at Best Buddies. <coughs> and Best Buddies has really given me a passion and a focus in life. 
and it's also given me about 200 best friends, which is awesome, um, including William. <laughs> and um, my buddy Terry and I, whenever we see each other in the hallway, we do our secret handshake, and it includes like lots of dance moves. And honestly, what Best Buddies has given me is fearlessness to not like I'm not scared of embarrassing myself anymore. I'm not scared of putting myself out there. I'm always ready to advocate for someone who falls down. Um, and I always celebrate the small victories in life. And at Washington Lee, I've really seen the impact that this program has had on our community. It's grown into the largest student run organization. And I've slowly watched my peers stop saying the R word. I've watched student leaders with disabilities become more involved in their communities. And I've just seen the profound change it has. So I just, I just wanna thank you guys for supporting this wonderful program at our schools. Thank you. Best Buddies is a nonprofit organization that raises awareness for kids with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Yeah. I hang out with my buddies like Essie and go places then. Hi, I just want to take just a few moments to introduce myself. I am Michaela Barba. I am proud to be William's stepmom. And I want to just, uh, for a few minutes, provide a parent perspective. Best Buddies became a household name in my household five years ago. So when William came home five years ago with a flyer to join this group, I thought, oh, goodness, another group. I can't, I just can't keep track of all of the activities that my younger son and all of the stuff that we had to do for William, IEPs, school, everything. And um, about three years ago, we would have birthday parties for William every year. And about three years ago, um, I had to stop inviting my friends, kids, and our family because William and all of the best buddies overtook our entire house <laughs> and ate all of the food. It has been a passion and mission for me as well. I'm one of the board members, and I can't say enough good things about what Best Buddies has brought to me as a parent, to William, and to William's brother. William's brother views William as a rock star. That in itself, I think, speaks to how amazing this program has been. The walk on Saturday, for me, embodies everything that Best Buddies is about. We walk hand in hand. It's just a great family party. If any of you are around on Saturday, come, come check us out. It's really an amazing event. I am just so proud of everything all of these young best buddies have done and given to my son, and I'm just so grateful to all of you for having us here tonight and all of your support. Thank you. Thank you, Essie, William, and Miss Barbara. We have representatives from the Yorktown Best Buddies group. We have Rebecca Joskow, the president, and we have buddy director, um, uh, Kelvin Sifuentes and Nina Rutson, Vice President. My name is Rebecca Joskow and I'm the President of Best Buddies at Yorktown High School. I want to thank the Arlington School Board for recognizing the wonderful work that the Best Buddies organization does for students with intellectual and developmental disabilities. I also want to thank Rachel Letters, our program supervisor, and Mr. Burnett, our advisor at Yorktown High School, for all the support they give to our chapter at the school. This week, I received an email from the father of one of our new buddies. He wrote, Rebecca, I'm sure you hear this from other parents, but what you and your fellow students are doing as a part of Best Buddies means the world to us, especially for our son, who is a social guy and really enjoys friendships and inclusion, and who learns social modeling and interaction from his friends. We love this program. This is coming from a parent who is very new to the program, and I can already tell that he understands our mission from just those two words, friendship and inclusion. That's what Best Buddies is all about, friendship and inclusion. Those two words epitomize our mission. Those words embody the meaningful friendships, welcoming atmosphere, and inclusive community we are striving to foster at Yorktown with Best Buddies. 
It's not just the parents who appreciate what we do at Best Buddies. It's the students with and without disabilities whose lives are completely changed by participating in Best Buddies. I know my life has been changed by Best Buddies and it has helped so many other lives too. A few of our events and activities so far this year have been a tie-dye party, a pizza party, and a Halloween-themed match party where we wrapped our peer buddies like mummies for the big reveal. We are looking forward to walk, walking in the homecoming parade tomorrow as a club, going on a hayride later this month, and the Best Buddies prom in the spring. We are also super excited about the Best Buddies Capital Region Friendship Walk this Saturday. Yorktown has over 100 team members walking, and we have raised almost $12,000 for the Friendship Walk. The look of pure joy on the faces of our buddies when they come running to our meetings is incredible. All of our hard work is worth it when we see everyone smiling, laughing, and hugging. Our friendships at Best Buddies start a chain reaction of inclusion and positivity. For me, Best Buddies has been the most rewarding part of my high school experience. I'm so excited to continue our efforts with Best Buddies at Yorktown this year. I'll close with, that, with a quote that one of our buddies said to me. He said, I can't wait for Best Buddies, I just love it. Best Buddies is like my family. I can't think of a better way to describe Best Buddies. Thank you. Hi, my name is Kelvin Cifuentes. Um, I love Best Buddies, and Best Buddies has changed my life. I um, grew a lot, didn't have friends. Then when I joined Best Buddies, it, it just changed my life a whole lot. And now I'm on a Young's Leader Council. I got selected from 13 people and I was, it was just amazing being on that part now, being on the YLC family, and now being still with Best Buddies Kappa Region family. It's just, Best Buddies has grown in my life with so many buddies that I've gotten this year. It's just been amazing. And now I'm being an advisor for Yardtown this year. It's just changed my life. I'm Nina Rutson. I'm the Vice President of Best Buddies Yorktown, and Best Buddies has changed my life in so many different ways. Um, I had a buddy for two years starting out my freshman year. It wasn't very common for freshmen to get buddies, and then I found out one of my friends was going to be my buddy, and I was beyond excited. And we formed this great friendship and would hang out and everything, and we just formed a great bond. Um, he moved to Portland uh, over the summer, and that was very upsetting, but we still keep in touch, and that just attests to the amount of, um, like, it just, it just shows how much Best Buddies can help you form a bond. And my, I have a new buddy this year, and we've already just grown this amazing friendship that, like, no other, so. Thank you, Nina, Rebecca, and Kelvin. And actually, I apologize because I neglected to um, introduce the Yorktown Best Buddies sponsor, staff sponsor, um, Brandon Burnett. Mr. Burnett is right here. Thank you for, jo thank you for joining us this evening. Uh, we also have uh, some representatives from our Wakefield Best Buddies uh, organization. We have Hannah Goldstein and Siraj Hammam. Uh, joining us, our staff sponsor, Greg Campbell, was not able to join us this evening from the Wakefield Best Buddies. Um, my name is Hannah Goldstein, and I'm a junior this year at Wakefield. I actually started Best Buddies um, last year, was my first year, because um, for various reasons, but I'd been volunteering with Project 5, a program over the summer for people with IDD. And I just want to say that Best Buddies, like I went to a leadership conference in Indiana over the summer. It just changed my life because it was the most positive environment I think I've ever been in. Like you can just walk up to someone and be like, hi, like you seem like a cool person, let's talk. Like it was just the most amazing experience to me. And I'm like so excited to bring that back to Wakefield with everyone and share it. <laughs> Thank you, Hannah and Siraj. 
And we'd like to thank everyone from uh, Stratford Friends and Best Buddies from Stratford, HB, um, Washington Lee, Wakefield, and Yorktown. Thank you all for joining us this evening and um, uh, the activities that you're involved with are uh, important for during school and for in the future for a lifetime. Thank you, everyone. All right. Thank you. If all of our best buddies and sponsors who are available can come up in the front, we can be able to get a picture for everyone. As, as people are leaving, I do want to thank all the parents and friends who came out to support our program. I think they're feeling okay. Thank you all so much for coming out. We really appreciate the program. It was terrific. Great way to start the evening, right? We've all, we're all smiling now. Thank you so much, and um, uh, Dr. Natris, anyone else who helped get this, uh, pull that program together was really, really terrific. Great way to start the evening. Uh, we are now at announcements. On Friday, October 27th, the board will hold, will hold a committee of the whole meeting in the board conference room at 8.30 a.m. That is a public board meeting. Uh, board members, do you have any announcements? Ms. Van Doren. I do, thank you very much. Um, Let's see. I have a couple of slides that are should be come up. One is about the Jeremy, can you help us out in the back? I think Ms. Van Dorn has a couple of slides. Substitute out my announcements. Walk and bike to school day two thousand and seventeen and discovery eco action team. Let's see. I will I will speak and hopefully he will bring it up. So I wanted to point out, as I'm always trying to about transportation, that we had walk and bike to school day, and we uh, had an increase in staff participation from 128 employees last year to 195 employees this year, which is a phenomenal increase. And the schools that had the greatest participation from staff members were Yorktown, Patrick Henry, K.W. Barrett, Nottingham, and Swanson. So congratulations to them, and I hope that we do more of that in the future. So we would love to see everybody as involved in that as possible. I also want to take a moment to recognize the Discovery Eco Action Team, which, um, if we had the slides up, has a, uh, does a great deal of work looking at how much 
uh, CO2 gets emitted, the different ways that they can work on reducing carbon dioxide in uh, their daily lives by biking and walking to school. And one of the activities that I wanted to share with you that the kids are involved in, and I would encourage everybody to do this, you can get these bike maps just about anywhere in Arlington and at every school. And if you open them up, you can find that your schools are flagged on these. And if you take a simple cup and put it around your location, I'm doing this around the Ed Center right now, where the cup is, is a 10 minute walk from you. So then you can explore, if you do a circle around it, where you can walk in just 10 minutes. And you'd be amazed at how far you can go in 10 minutes. And then if you take a, paper, a, a, a bowl, that's a bowl, and put it around the same location, you can look at where you can bike in 10 minutes. And again, you would be amazed at how far you can get by walking and biking in 10 minutes. So I encourage all of you to get your free maps to figure out how far you can walk and how far you can bike and do that on a regular basis because it really helps the environment, it helps our community, and it makes us all more fit. So thank you, please do it, it's lots of fun. Okay. Yes, excellent. I'm, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. Uh, any other announcements? I think uh, Dr. Murphy, do you have announcements? Yes, I do. Thank you very much. Got a switch out going on here. And Ms. Van Dorn, they did get your sli s slides up there while you were talking about your map. So let me start uh, with today's activity and uh, thank a host of people that were involved in that. We had a number of board members out where we had a ceremony uh, today at the new building at the Wilson site, which will uh, be the future site for HB Woodlawn and the Stratford program. And we had uh, a number of our board members out there, Mr. Goldstein, uh, Dr. Cannon, Ms. Van Dorn, were able to make it out. We also had the principal from HB Woodlawn and Stratford there who made some remarks. Uh, we also had students from both schools who uh, prepared a time capsule and then we had a host of other folks uh, who played a supporting role to get us that far. I wanna recognize uh, Mr. Chadwick and his team, as well as uh, the contractors uh, who are beginning uh, the construction of the building and Ms. Erta's staff who uh, brought all this together. They've actually started, we traditionally go with, uh, you know, the golden shovels in the ground, but they've actually started. So today we had sort of a celebration and a, and a ceremony and it was very nice and the weather was extremely cooperative. We have another event uh, planned where they've already started, and that's for the new Alice West Fleet Elementary School, and that will be next Wednesday, and hopefully the weather will cooperate. We actually have a family member from Alice West Fleet's family coming out and gonna be a part of the um, ceremony and event. So um, as we continue to grow, we uh, continue to address that with some of our capital programming. Uh, I do want to make note that this week was uh, School uh, Bus Safety Week, October 16th through the 20th. I know we've had a, a number of different uh, recognitions at our schools. I know Mr. Chadwick there on the far left, uh, his team had a celebration, I believe it was yesterday, where they had a, a special lunch. But I also want to make note, and I've got uh, some uh, bumper stickers here uh, that our HR folks have put together. Thank you, uh, Dr. Murphy. Uh, sort of advertising um, that the need for hiring uh, bus drivers and looking at that as a possible career. If you come by the Ed Center too, you may make note that we have some yard signs and if you look at that middle uh, picture there, that's the design of our yard signs where we're encouraging folks to come on board and uh, start their career with us. Uh, and then finally, uh, you may have uh, noted at our last board meeting, we got some ideas from uh, one of our staff members, uh, Mr. Josh Fulb, and we've actually instituted a lot of those ideas for our recruiting methods. So um, I know we have a number of positions to fill. Uh, Mr. Chadwick, I'm gonna um, put you on the spot here as far as uh, we've had some vacancies, but can you tell us kind of where we stand right now with uh, fills and how many folks we have in classes? We have um, nine routes that don't have a permanent driver. Um, and then every day we have some drivers who call out for sickness or vacation or whatever. So we're actually um, keeping track of how many we have each day of the week and I'm sending that in a report to the superintendent. Um, we have classes starting all the time. We just had a class that graduated, I think with four in it. 
Unfortunately, two of them subsequently um, didn't return. So we continue to do that. And there have been a couple of recruiting events, I think, this week and another one scheduled for, la for next week. And we can't wait to see those yard signs, those bumper stickers, and um, all of the posters around town. So if you'd like to uh, join in on that campaign, we have bumper stickers available. Uh, by state law, we are not able to uh, promote or advertise on any of our buses. I know someone passed that along as a suggestion, but that's something we cannot do. Uh, but, you know, join the team and help us out. I'm going to give you a gentleman's name, Mr. Corey Dotson, and he is in our human resource recruitment coordinator, and you can go to our website and find out the contact information for Corey, and he would be the best person to contact if you're interested in starting your career with us as a bus driver or a uh, bus assistant. We've got the uh, culminating event for Harvesting Dreams of Our Children coming up as part of Hispanic Heritage tomorrow. Uh, that event kicks off at 5.30 with the uh, kind of the formal program starting at 6.30. I understand we'll have uh, three breakout sessions that will culminate with uh, uh, an end of year or end of evening celebration. So if you'd like to come out and celebrate with us, there's going to be some excellent food, uh, as there always has been. And I think there will be some good information sessions uh, for families who want to come out. And this has been kind of a tradition here of how we end up our Hispanic Heritage Month celebration. So we look forward to seeing you tomorrow night at Kenmore. We're also getting ready for a middle and high school information night. Uh, they're both coming up here on uh, consecutive Mondays. We've got the middle school event coming up on October the 23rd, and that'll be right next door here at Washington Lee starting at 7 p.m. And then the following Monday on October 30th, we have high school information night again, 7 p.m. at Washington Lee. Uh, we'll go over with uh, parents of rising uh, you know, sixth and eighth graders, uh, some of the activities uh, that will be uh, happening uh, at middle school, and we'll also talk with them a little bit about giving them a chance to talk with some of the principals uh, that are there and assistant principals and administrators. Uh, I also have uh, noted that if you can't come out, we're also going to be uh, live streaming the presentation on our website and also on Facebook, so uh, making accommodations across the board uh, for folks. Uh, October is Dyslexia Awareness Month. We have a special activity planned this year on October the 28th. That's a Saturday from 9 to 3. And again, at Kenmore, we've got a number of keynote speakers coming out. We'll have a variety of different uh, sessions planned for parents uh, about dyslexia and also around the idea of reading and literacy. This is in connection with our Disability uh, History Awareness Month, which is part of October this year. A couple of uh, recognitions uh, that I'll start out with uh, this evening uh, for our budget staff and Ms. Leslie Peterson. We have the Metorious uh, Budget Award. Uh, this is something that Arlington has uh, received uh, for a number of years, but I know it's a, a team effort and it's led by Ms. Peterson and her entire staff. So let's please give her uh, a round of applause for that. And then we have one of our parents who was uh, the recipient of the Education in Equity Award, uh, and it's Donora Del Carmen Casisis, and she's a parent leader at, and facilitator at Gunston Middle School, so we're very proud of her and the work that she's done uh, and being recognized by the Mid-Atlantic Equity Consortium. So uh, she's not here, but let's give her a round of applause as well. So a little bit later in my announcements, you'll hear me go over some of this information about middle school boundaries, but it's always good to hear it in a, a variety of different formats. We've been leading up to gathering some information, and now we're going to be coming back next week and sharing that out with what we've heard. On Tuesday, October the 24th at Kenmore, uh, we're going to have um, a session f uh, which is going to be for um, our families who are Spanish-speaking only. That'll be followed up then on October the 25th at Yorktown uh, with another session from 7 to 9. Uh, and that will, you can watch that online and also provide input. And then on Thursday, October the 26th at Wakefield again from 7 to 9. 
This is all leading up then to the recommendation that I'll be bringing forward on the 14th. We've got a public hearing slated for the board meeting on November 30th, and then uh, the board is slated to make a decision on December the 14th. You can also go to Engage and find out an update on this and some of the other initiatives that we have rolling out and that are, are moving forward. I want to share uh, with folks who uh, may not be aware of uh, the opportunity that I've had to serve on the Governor's SOL Innovation Committee. Uh, and this has been uh, going on now for, I think, the last uh, 18 months that I've had an involvement. It's a citizen committee. It is made up of citizens, but it's also made up of uh, state legislators who are part of this group. Uh, and this year, the charge was to look at high school redesign and also to look at assessment. Uh, and I had the opportunity to lead the, uh, the high school redesign subcommittee. Uh, and so I just want to highlight for you in context to what's happening next, uh, what some of our recommendations were, uh, and then what should be some next steps that we would be looking uh, toward. Uh, one of the pieces that has uh, been you know, a large discussion is around workforce readiness. And the workforce readiness really relates to what you often hear mentioned as part of the five C's. And I think this also connects very nicely with some of the things that we're doing with our strategic planning uh, phase that's coming up. But critical thinking, creative thinking, collaboration, communication, and citizenship. So we looked on the high school redesign of how we embed those five C's into a curriculum, but also into future instructional work. Uh, there has also been a lot of discussion about workforce readiness and then how we provide authentic learning experiences for students. Now, there are 132 school divisions across the state. They all look very different than Arlington. Some of them are extremely rural. Some of them look like us. Some of them also are located in small cities. So we wanted to interpret that very broadly about what those learning experiences might look like. And with our recommendations, we also recognize there needs to be uh, professional development connected with that. And we also see what's happening in the teacher uh, profession as far as not as many people pursuing that as a career. So we want to begin also to work with higher education in preparation programs and also look at licensure, how folks may have the prerequisite skills to move into uh, education, but how could that be crosswalked with some of the other experiences that they've had. There continues to be uh, uh, a focus on what I'll say standardized tests. And a lot of the committee members felt very strongly about the shift. As you know, they've reduced a number of the standardized assessments that are out there. Uh, but um, a number of our committee members were even calling for a further reduction. Um, while that did not um, move forward as one of the recommendations that was voted up, I think we made some strong inroads um, with uh, you know, the state board as well as with legislators around the idea of performance-based assessments. And really what that is is another way for students to demonstrate their knowledge and their learning. There has to be professional development connected with that, so um, it's just not something that's an easy step. Uh, and I think it's something that I'm talking up with our staff a lot about how can we strengthen uh, our performance assessments and then how can we also demonstrate that students know, have that knowledge. So a continued discussion. I think everyone, um, you know, embraces these ideas. Um, I think the devil is in the detail about how we demonstrate that and, and bring that to fruition. So I give you all that as a backdrop because this is moving forward as a recommendation from the citizens group to the state board. The state board has a meeting coming up next week. They also um, have a, a decision point in November, and this may influence then graduation requirements for students who are entering as freshmen in the fall of 2018. So that's kind of how all these pieces fit together. Um, I haven't been sharing a lot about this because it's been in motion, but I think that snapshot gives you some idea about where we are and what's happening, and also just makes folks alert to be looking for state board action as it comes down the road. So thank you for um, you know, endeavoring into a little bit more detail uh, and less brevity, but I think, I think we're at an important crossroads here uh, on this. 
Uh, we are, by the way, coming to the close of the end of the first quarter. As you know, uh, on the 26th and 27th, we've got elementary school conferences, talking that up with principals. We've got middle school conferences. I do want to recognize some of our middle schools. They've elected to start on Thursday evening and then do Friday morning. Uh, so the teachers are sort of flexing their time. And I think that gets into a little bit of uh, voice and choice and uh, also accommodating parents' schedules. So I want to thank our teachers and our administrators for doing that. And then November 6th, we've got the end of the first grading period uh, that is slated. Uh, I do want to also mention uh, we've got our APS Color Leadership Middle School Girls Conference coming up. That's not until November 18th. But sometimes we come a little bit late to the plate, so I wanted to be early with this. If you are interested in attending this conference, which is about leadership, uh, I encourage you to ask either your principal or your counselor about it or the Minority Student Achievement Coordinator. It's going to be held at Marymount uh, University, and this is open to all middle school girls. We have a compliment conference for young men, and that occurs in uh, early spring. But right now, this one's slated, and I wanted to make sure that we got this message out here, and we had a couple of board meetings to, to talk about that and promote that. So that is all of my announcements this evening. I'll leave the uh, bumper stickers here with Ms. Mercado. So if you want to pick up a bumper sticker while you're also picking up a speaker uh, slip, you can do the same. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Murphy. We are now ready to act on our consent agenda. May I have a motion to adopt our consent agenda? So moved. Is there a second? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes five to zero. I am pleased to announce that as part of the consent agenda, the board appointed Kristen Haldeman as director of multimodal transportation planning. Kristen. <laughs> Over the past 13 years, Ms. Haldeman has served as a transportation analyst, senior planner, and planning manager for the Washington Metropolitan Area Transit Authority, WMATA. She brings a wealth of experience in transportation policy, compliance, and planning administration to this new position at APS. As a parent and community member, Ms. Haldeman also served as chair of the first APS Transportation Focused Committee, the Multimodal Transportation and Student Safety Special Committee, shall I try to say the letters, or MMTSSSC. She currently serves as chair of the ACTC Advisory Council on Transportation Choices, a joint committee that supports both APS and county. Welcome, Ms. Haldeman. Um, we always appreciate our new uh, employees and know how hard they work, and we're always happy to have family um, supporting you, and we want them to know how much we appreciate the exhausting hours that, that, we, that, that we expect of our staff. Um, uh, Ms. Haldeman, do you have anyone here that you'd like to introduce us to? And he already understands the importance of public service and how, how dedicated we, yeah, you will be. Thank you so much uh, for coming out. We really appreciate it. Yes, and we heard, yes. We heard you have a, a band concert to get to. So, all right. Thank you so much for coming out. Oh, and also as part of consent, the board appointed Ms. Christina Diaz-Torres to fill a vacancy on the Budget Advisory Committee. We will now hear citizen comment. Is she, is she here? I don't. Okay. We will now hear citizen comment on non-agenda items. First, I will read the speaker guidelines. We do have speakers, Ms. Mercado, correctly? Correct? Okay. We have four speakers. Okay. So I'll read the guidelines first. The school board welcomes public comment. Generally, school board members do not respond to comments during the meetings. If you've not already signed up online, speakers must submit a speaker slip to the clerk before the agenda item they wish to speak on is called. Each speaker may speak for up to two minutes. There's a timer to help you keep track of your time, and speakers should conclude their remarks when the buzzer sounds. All comments should address a matter related to Arlington Public Schools. 
Speakers should be courteous and address their comments to the entire school board. Speakers are called in the order in which they sign up. If you have written comments, please give them to the clerk. We ask the audience to refrain from applauding as that takes time away from our next speakers. Ms. Mercado, would you like to call the first speaker, please? Uh, yes, Ms. Lily Hailu. That's good. Good evening, board members. My name is Lily Hailu. I'm sorry about my voice. My name is Lily Hilo. I'm a parent of two wonderful children attending Patrick Henry as kindergarten and third grade. Henry is the most diverse school in Arlington. The benefit of diversity that we found is helping the children to learn a different culture and history. Research shows that racially diverse schools give students more opportunities to learn about each other, which leads to improved critical thinking and problem solving skills. In today's global economy, their workforces must include highly trained employees of all races, religions, culture, and economic backgrounds. There is a say, it takes a village to raise a child. One child at a time will power a community. I hope that your decision will allow the community that has been built to stay together as they transition to the, the, to the middle school. Thank you. Speaker is Betsy Zimmerman Lockman. Good evening. I'm Betsy Zimmerman Lockman, Vice President of the Washington Lee High School Alumni Association. My older sister and I are graduates of the two largest classes of WNL history, 1955 and 1960. My mother was a teacher at WNL. My ties to the institution are solid. Arlington County was named in 1920 to include the presence of Arlington House, which was the home of Mary Custis. She married Robert E. Lee in 1831, and they lived in Arlington House for 30 years. The National Park Service writes that in 1925, the United States designated Arlington House a national memorial to Robert E. Lee, honoring the respect he earned from the North and South when he uh, pushed for reconstruction after the Civil War. Washington College in Lexington, Virginia, asked Lee to serve as its president after that war. He died in 1870, and the school was then renamed Washington and Lee University. In 1925, the first high school was built in Arlington County and proudly took its name from that institution. WNL has held the distinguished name for more than 90 years and has received national and state recognition for its academic programs and distinguished graduates. In my professional career as an elementary and middle school classroom teacher in Arlington and Fairfax counties, I always emphasize to my young students the importance of being educated about the pros and cons of a situation before making a good decision. I believe that to be true of adults as well. In this time of unrest, we need to focus on the history of our county, state, and country. Then we'll be able to make solid decisions based on facts, not emotions. History tells a story, and the story can't be changed. To erase or change the name of WNL will not solve the underlying problems of the issue. We must educate ourselves, students, and community and honor the strengths of the two statesmen for which our school is named. In 92 years, nearly 40,000 students have walked on these grounds, worn the blue and gray colors, and experienced General's pride. Let's remember, when the moon comes up and the sun goes down, WNL will shine. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Ms. Megan Haydas. Good evening. I appreciate APS taking advantage of opening its new sixth middle school as an opportunity to redraw middle school boundaries for the entire county. And I hope you will do the same with elementary school boundaries in the coming year as well. While I realize that APS staff will be releasing revised boundary maps next week, I still feel compelled to publicly appeal for economic diversity to be a primary factor in this and all school boundary decisions, particularly since Arlington already has significant economic disparity across its middle schools. 
I understand that the school system is not entirely responsible for Arlington County housing policies that have concentrated the vast majority of economically disadvantaged students in South Arlington. However, I still believe our goal should be decreasing rather than exacerbating the economic segregation of Arlington Public Schools. Instead, some of the middle school boundary scenarios staff has put forth would increase the economic disparity, with some middle schools as high as 55% economically disadvantaged and others as low as 2%. Not only that, some of these scenarios would also make the most economically disadvantaged middle schools the most overcrowded, while others would be left under, under capacity. As leaders in our community, I believe the school board has a moral responsibility to offer equitable educational opportunities to our most vulnerable students, not just those with the resources to lobby for their interests. There is compelling research to show that diverse schools provide better educational outcomes, while schools with concentrated poverty lead to differences in teacher expectations, homework, academic rigor, and safety, which in turn lead to declines in student performance. My school community, the Henry Jefferson Wakefield District, currently has a diverse socioeconomic mix, with anywhere from 33 to 46% of each school's students qualifying for free and reduced meals. We embrace this diversity and want to retain it going forward. We simply ask that rather than increasing our economic disparities, you work toward a better balance across all of Arlington's schools. I look forward to reviewing what I hope are next week's improved middle school boundary options. Thank you for your service and consideration. Krista Sickert Bush. Good evening, school board members. My name is Krista Sigurdbush. My family was honored to join the Patrick Henry community over 11 years ago from Seattle, Washington. Our oldest daughter began her public education at Patrick Henry in kindergarten and recently transitioned to Jefferson. And our youngest daughter is a third grader at Henry. Both are adopted, one is Caucasian and one is biracial. As Dr. Martin Luther King reminds us, the function of education is to teach one to think intensively and to think critically. Intelligence plus character are true goals for our children. Children learn character just like math or reading because it comes from people who are different than us. Patrick Henry's beloved community based on justice, equal opportunity, and love of one's fellow human being challenges our perspectives. It uplifts the notion of global longing and ends with lifelong friendships for all of us on this journey of life. Patrick Henry, as you have already heard, is one of the most socioeconomic, racially diverse, and inclusive school communities. In Map 1D planning, units like Lily's 46132 would be one of three Henry, Henry planning units being moved from Jefferson to Gunston. Children would be moved, beloved communities would be broken, and the school board's terms of proximity, efficiency, and demographic diversity would not be achieved. We hope that you will take this into consideration as you look at drawing new boundaries. Thank you for your time. Okay, thank you all very much for coming out tonight. We are gonna move on to the next section of our agenda. We're at uh, monitoring items. Tonight we have three monitoring items. The first is the superintendent's update on the 2017-2018 action plan. Dr. Murphy. Thank you, Dr. Cannon. Um, as we do regularly at our meetings, we review where we are with some of our planning this year. And as uh, many of you know, we have uh, 14 different projects that I'm going to outline here uh, that we're moving forward with. Uh, the action plan focus really here is designed around creating the best learning experience for all of our students, and this is really connected to the whole idea which I made mention earlier about, that we have our strategic plan, uh, a new strategic plan coming online. We are also looking at the uh, increasing growth, and I made note of that with uh, the two ceremonies that we have with additional uh, capital projects as well. 
As you'll note, some of this is very integrated, it's complex, and it is overlapping, and I think the illustration that best explains that is some of the decisions that we're making with our middle school boundaries and then our elementary school boundaries as one example of how those things are happening. So we've talked about uh, really what these action plans look like and how they fall out into essentially uh, four distinct areas, the first being new policies and policy revisions, also around operational planning, and a lot of that has to do with either annual or every other year planning around specific uh, activities. We've got preparations for new schools and program moves, and then we also have some ongoing capital initiatives that are playing themselves out. Last year, thanks to our team with uh, School and Community Relations and now the relationship we have with our new planning office, we have developed this microsite uh, engage with us at um, APS. Uh, you can go to this site and you can find out the status of a number of our initiatives related to some one-pagers uh, that outline the direction and the plans. It also lays out the schedule and it uh, you know, um, announces meetings as well as uh, decision points that are coming about. And I'll highlight some of those uh, this evening. Uh, but that's a good resource for you to continue to kind of check back with and find out um, where we are. So when we look at new policies and policy revisions, uh, we've uh, addressed the options and transfers and follow-up, which we're going to be moving to our strategic planning process. Next slated in this area is our acceptable use with one-to-one -one devices. Uh, and while we um, have a schedule for that, as far as what the update will look like, we've got slated a community meeting planned for the 15th. This is slated then to come to the board as an information item on January the 4th, and then a school board action. I know there's also been a, a variety of community discussion about this, and so what we've put in place temporarily to address this across all of our schools is some interim guidance that we've shared with all of our principals, and the principals are then moving ahead uh, and implementing that and sharing that with their community. I think some of the concerns that we've seen around this have to do with screen time, also making sure that students are, aren't substituting uh, use of technology in lieu of getting outside and enjoying recess. And so I think the important part of, about this is we have conveyed this message, especially to our elementary principals. So you should be looking for, or if not already received, information about that interim guidance while we work on this acceptable use policy. Uh, the next is the prep for new school and program moves, and you can see the uh, elementary school boundaries, which is slated for the early part of next year, 2018, that's January 2018. We are also uh, beginning the Montessori move, and that planning is underway, and I made mention in my announcements, as I'll do here again, we've got the middle school boundary process that is already in pro progress. So there's the example of how these things uh, you know, are integrated or overlapping, and when we looked at how this was needing to move forward, the sense was to make these decisions around middle school and then address uh, elementary school boundaries uh, in the, in the first part of the year. I've covered uh, this in my announcements, uh, just highlighting it uh, again. Um, you've, we've got a number of meetings slated for next week. Uh, on uh, the 24th at Kenmore with Spanish speaking and then at two of our high schools on the 25th and 26th uh, respectively. Uh, the one piece here is you can watch uh, the meetings and you can also provide input up until November the 3rd. So we encourage folks to do that. Again, visiting the Engage website. And then we've got slated, I'll be bringing the recommendation forward on the 14th, public hearing on the board meeting on the 30th and a school board action slated for the 14th. And we've gotten good feedback about that. People seem to have a working knowledge of that, and so we'll continue to do that and uh, strongly communicate where we are as we move forward. When we move to operational planning, I've highlighted strategic planning. We also have the budget process. We'll be coming back to you here uh, a little bit later this fall with the Arlington Facility and Student Accommodation Plan update and CIP framework, which is slated for several meetings here a little bit later. And then we also have capital improvement planning that is planned after we adopt the budget for uh, the latter part of the spring. 
Let me jump, though, back up to the top with strategic planning. I want to thank uh, the community for the number of folks who, um, you, know, uh, you know, responded and uh, were interested in serving on the strategic planning committee. We are just about wrapping that up, and the plan is to finalize that tomorrow and making contact with all of the, um, the folks who were interested and uh, letting them know the status. On Monday, our plan then is to announce to the larger community what that uh, committee looks like, uh, and then we're already beginning to move forward with meeting schedules and plans uh, for how that will lay out as we move actually through the, the next six months. If you were not selected or, or part of uh, the initial committee, there are gonna be a number of opportunities that we're gonna need um, community engagement. Uh, and these are open meetings, by the way, so if you'd like to come and listen in, uh, there will also be a public comment portion of the meetings. So we invite you to, um, you know, there's plenty of opportunities or way that you can participate just beyond the, uh, the initial part of being on the committee. So again, thank you. I think we, uh, we had a number of folks uh, involved in participating and look for a, an announcement to be uh, pushed out here uh, the first part of next week. We also have in the next group uh, a number of our capital initiatives from the Career Center uh, to the Education Center. Dr. Natras is gonna talk a little bit more in detail about that. And then also the Reed Building. We were up at uh, the Reed Building the other night with the County Board, uh, and we talked uh, about that in relationship to the appointments of the BLPC and the PFRC. Uh, and Mr. Chadwick and his team shared uh, kind of where we are with that project. I do want to go back up to the top of the, uh, the page and just address one issue in regards to the Career Center. Uh, there was an error in how some information was conveyed or related in a community meeting, and I want to kind of set this, uh, the stage uh, you know, uh, clear on this, and it's in relationship to Arlington Community High School as well as to the programs that are here uh, that are housed at the Career Center. And there are no plans uh, to relocate or change any of those programs, either Arlington Community High School and or the programs at the Career Center. Uh, that information was misconveyed. I do want to make note that Ms. Chung is here this evening, and I spoke with her the day after that event, as well as the principal at Arlington Community High School. By the way, neither of them had heard um, one iota about that, but I wanted them to know from, as I say, the horse's mouth, that, um, in fact, um, that, uh, that information was in error and that if they had heard it, they could approach it or um, address it promptly and uh, clear the air on it. I did also have the chance to speak with the Arlington Community High School faculty the other day as part of my visiting tour uh, to the start of the beginning of the year, and I conveyed the same message to them that I'm uh, passing along to you. So hopefully that, uh, that error will get uh, cleared up if it got any uh, traction. So, um, with that as a little bit of a backdrop, um, I'll turn it over here to Dr. Natras. Um, uh, Ms. Stingle is also here this evening, and I just want to thank uh, both her and Dr. Natras for the work they've been doing, along with our folks in school and community relations. Uh, we've got a number of items that are up on the website, and we've uh, received a number of compliments from the community kind of about the information that's out there and how we continue to roll with that. So I just want to thank staff uh, for the work they're doing. So let me turn it over here to Dr. Natras to talk a little bit about the Education Center. There you are. Right behind Hi. you. Hi. Good evening. Um, as we are approaching the time to bring this forward as an information item, we wanted to catch you up to date a little bit on a lot of the work that's been happening over the last several months on the Ed Center. And so I'm actually going to take us all the way back to last January when we started talking about an instructional focus for wherever the 1,300 seats may have been located. This was part of our work as we were discussing the various options for location, and we worked with the Advisory Council on Instruction, and in January they gave us 16 different options for what our instructional choices may be, regardless of the location. 
And then as we were doing that work, we also did a community questionnaire in February and March that gave us about 2,300 responses for the types of instructional programs that the community overall is interested in. And we asked several key questions around elementary, middle, and high school. And with those results, what we learned was that STEAM, so science, technology, engineering, arts, and math, STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math, or project-based learning were the top three areas of focus that the community was most interested in when talking about instruction. Um, then we had IB as a high choice, and then arts. And so we've used that information as we've had some conversation around various options, as well as the 16 potential options from the Advisory Council on Instruction when we were talking about locations. Then at the end of June, the board um, approved the motion to put five to 600 of those seats here at the Education Center site. And at the school board work session on August 31st, we discussed our process for moving forward in that work. So since that time, we've been working with several different groups to analyze the options. So we started with the 16 options from the Advisory Council on Instruction. We narrowed that to 10 based on a couple of things. One was kind of duplication of programs. The other was interest and fit with the Education Center. So one of the examples is an online high school that was something that had come through ACI and that's something that did not really have a lot of interest in the community, nor will it help us fill seats, right, if it's totally online. So that's not one that we considered as the 10. We've been, since about the end of September, working with a group of APS staff, students, as well as our ACI chairs to move from those 10 options down to, we had always said it would be two to three, we ended up with four that have been shared with the community based on the analysis and are now in the community engagement piece at a higher level to this work. And so we had a community engagement session last night and we had probably about 20 or so people here, and then we had well over 100, I think the number was 135, that were watching through the live streaming and are already getting responses um, today with the community questionnaire that will be open now through November 1st. And so we've already started tracking some of those responses and things as we're going through the work. The analysis that was done was done primarily with that internal team that did include a couple of ACI representatives as well because they're very heavily invested in this work. And with the first couple of meetings that we had, we had a lot of conversation around what is most important when we're thinking about the instructional focus. What are the things that we need to consider in terms of criteria as we're thinking about narrowing from those 10 options down to the three or four? And so you can see here the criteria that we considered. We looked at things, and Dr. Murphy alluded to this earlier, we have a lot of um, programs and projects that while separated out in those four buckets are very much interconnected. And so while this is a project in thinking about the Ed Center, it is also related to a lot of the other work that we're doing with the career center analysis, with the work that we're doing um, as we add new schools to the system. And so one of the big things that is in this criteria is does the program that we're considering complement a current program or fill a needed gap, right? So is there something when we look holistically across the board at all of our high schools and the options that we have, does whatever we're looking at fill a gap or complement what we have? Because what we really want is as students are entering high school to be able to say, all right, here's what I love, and I can access that particular program. And so that's one, when we're thinking about this, that pulls this project into other projects. We're also looking at things like workforce demand, alignment to the profile of a graduate, um, and Dr. Murphy spoke a little bit about some of that work earlier. Things like long-term viability, whatever we um, place here, can we keep it, or is there the adaptability with the building design to allow it to morph if needed? program access and equity, 
and demand, things like staffing availability. And what you see here are weighted criteria. And we had a lot of conversation with the group around which of these things have what level of weight to them when you think about it, because not all of them are equally as important. And so you see on a scale of one to 10, the weights for the things we considered. On the right-hand side, you see the logistics. So regardless of the program, there are going to be logistics that we really need to consider with those instructional options. So things like staffing cost, shared space, um, the operating costs, the impact on the neighborhood, parking, buses, transportation. Regardless of the instructional program that is placed at the Education Center, these are all things that we need to be thinking about, and so we're gathering and finalizing the data on each of those things as well to be able to have that for each of the individual programs. Sometimes it's going to be the same across each of the options. Um, sometimes it'll be a little bit different based on what that option is. And so from that analysis, we narrowed to four options, and these are the four that were presented last night to the community. The first is the idea of a STEAM high school, and a STEAM high school really is an approach where we're looking at science, technology, engineering, and math through an arts lens. Um, there was a lot of discussion last night about how is this different from what's happening at Arlington Tech? How is this different from um, just a STEM program? And the answer is it has this arts kind of focus to it that we may or may not have in other STEM programs. There was a lot of conversation back to this, does it complement current programs or does it compete with current programs? And so that's something that we're really considering with that option with all of the great work that's happening at Arlington Tech because we don't want something that's too similar, right? And that came out in some of the feedback last night. Another option is a creative and performing arts high school. And this is one that really specializes in teaching visual and performing arts and has that focus while still having the kind of rigor that we want within all of our classes as students are thinking about college and career. The third is an early college, and this is something that I think is really important to understand what we're really talking about when we talk about this. There was some misconception that these were online classes or that they were taught um, by teachers who were not APS teachers. An early college is a high school program. Students graduate with an associate's degree or the equivalent of um, the number of college credits. And then the final one is to expand Washington Lee to include additional international baccalaureate seats. So we know that the IB program um, is something that is well regarded within the community. Is there demand for additional seats is something that we're really looking at, but this would allow students from Yorktown or Wakefield who are interested in Washington Lee so that we would have additional seats to provide that. So that's the other option um, that we are looking at as we go through this process. So our next steps moving forward, we are continuing to analyze the options and incorporating some of the feedback and input that we're hearing. We have another meeting with that internal team next week. We also have several other community meetings that are happening between now and November 1st. We are going to combine, there is the middle school boundary meeting on October 24th that is for all of our Spanish speaking families. We are going to combine with that meeting the information that was shared last night as well as have computers and things for people to be able to complete the questionnaire. We are also engaging in several parent meetings over the course of the next couple of weeks. Um, Kenmore has a Wednesday's mom group that we're gonna recruit from some of the other schools in the area and attend that meeting because it's already a set meeting. We just go and we share the information. We will have information at Harvesting Dreams tomorrow night and we're gonna have iPads for people to do the questionnaire because we always get a really high turnout at that event. And we are also going to participate Monday night in an event at Woodbury Park. The community questionnaire is available now through November 1st. We know that's cutting it very close to the school board information item on November 2nd. It is an information item. We are monitoring the feedback. Um, we already started looking. We've got about 60 responses already from 
last night until now. So if that trend keeps up, we're going to have a good um, number. And a lot of the folks who were there last night were representing groups. So we had some of our school ambassadors there who were doing a lot of the work. We had some PTA presidents there. We had some ACI folks. And several of them said, I have to take lots of notes so I can take this back. And it's also recorded so people can watch it um, from last night and get that information. And I think one of the favorite comments that was made last night when looking at these four is that we're picking from really good options and that as we grow, we have the opportunity to offer a variety of things to our students and that each of these really has a lot to offer as we're thinking about how we continue to grow as a system. Um, so we will be coming back to you on November 2nd with the information item and then this is slated as an action item on November 14th. And I think that is the end of the update. Excellent. Thank you very much. Ms. Mercado, do we have any speakers? No speakers. Board colleagues, questions, comments? Ms. Talento. Um, Dr. Murphy, on the interim guidance for the one-to-one -one technology, and I apologize if you mention this, uh, is that going to be posted online for our community as well? I know that we um, worked with our principals and that we we're getting that information out, but is it also going to be available to parents somewhere online? Uh, yes, and I think part of that is the rollout. I think principals are beginning to roll that out this week, so we'll make sure that it is also posted. We wanted principals to be able to communicate it and share it with their staff so there were no surprises, but I, I know we've shared that and passed that along, so well, that, it's, that, still, it's still sort of rolling. No, I appreciate it. I had a, a PTA a liaison meeting last night with my PTA presidents for the schools that I was in, uh, that I work with, and they had asked that question, so it was a good opportunity, and that's very helpful. So good. if you can let us know when that happens, I can send that information out. I, I would say just start looking for it because I know that um, we wanted to make sure last week that all the principals, we had tagged with all the principals, and they had a an awareness of it and that's why I made the announcement tonight perfect so that'll be the next step so I would say in the next week to 10 days folks will be seeing that um, you know coming out from their schools okay great Do you, is there a place where they'll be able to find it on our website uh, yeah, we'll, we'll include it on the engage website under the, the policy Thank piece you. so that'll be one location uh, and then we'll also great. have it on um, I'm sure the uh, the website the school websites. Okay, that's great. I can. Let, I appreciate that. That way, I can share the information. And then I did have one question for you, Dr. Natris. Uh, the survey, the mm -hmm. questionnaire. Questionnaire. Yes. Uh, is it? Um, is a one? Okay, uh, I know that there's times where you can just submit one time. Mm -hmm. Do we have that control on our questionnaires yet? I know we had talked about this last year at some point, yep. and. I'm just curious because that also came up in some of the feedback I heard from the community members. Yes. So, yeah. And that's the challenging part of trying to seek right. comprehensive community feedback because the tools that we use have two options. We can either send things out as an email blast and hit email addresses or we can have a public link that anyone can access. Um, we've chosen the public link because we have a lot of families who maybe have students who are three or four years old and aren't in the system and we want their feedback. or um, other community members and so we went with that option we can track IP addresses so one of the things we did last year with the the questionnaire in February March was pull once you drop it into Excel you can see if there are repeats of that um, what we obviously can't control is if you, you have Correct. devices with different IP addresses but we'd rather get as much feedback as we can and hope that people are only completing the feedback form one time um, and that is our hope from the community and we can track IP addresses but we can't otherwise control. Thank you so much and I know that we have such a wonderful community that they will all respect yes. our honor code one, and only yes. submit one, one time <laughs> so that we can have a very objective yes. uh, feedback yeah. on that and thank That's you right. for that clarification I appreciate sure. it. Okay Mr. Goldstein. Um, thank you. Um, can you go back to slide three, please? So I also had a um, three. yeah, I also had a uh, a meeting last night with my liaison PTAs, and I used this slide, and they asked the question that I couldn't answer, which was, why is options and transfers checked, and why is acceptable use in such a different bolded font? 
Go right ahead. <laughs> you should have been in his meeting. Yeah. <laughs> she had her own meeting. I, I should have been we, in her yeah, meeting. Yeah, we should have combined our meetings. Oh, I, okay, I don't know if I know the answer, but I assumed it's because that's what's next up on the agenda. And the options and transfer follow-up we already decided will be put on our strategic plan, so it's de-highlighted. And so I expect that in next month's update, we'll have inclusion bolded and acceptable use will be not bolded. But that is my guess. And that teaches me to not respond um, out of turn. <laughs> the only thing I would add, Mr. Goldstein. What grade did she get? Uh, she, she got an A. The only thing I would add as a caveat is the unusual nature of the interim guidance because that was such a, an issue that was of high level and concern that we did take the uh, initial step with the interim technology guidance that Ms. Talento made mention of. And so uh, that may highlight or just denote it. I also think uh, there are a number of projects that we have up here. So if we can identify and um, you know, share with the community as well as staff things that we're moving forward on, uh, that's the result of the check marks. So it's, it's more symbolic than anything else. I do, actually. Thank you. Can you go ahead the slide? Uh, thank you very much. Can you go ahead the slide eight? Sure. So I really just wanted to make a comment on this, and I really wanted to make it before the folks who spoke at the non-agenda item um, public comment left, but uh, I'll make it now. And that is that I and we have gotten a lot of feedback from the community about the uh, materials that were um, previewed or shown at the middle school boundary getting started meeting on October 4th, uh, 2nd and 4th. And I just want to say again that these uh, maps and other materials were illustrative examples of what um, a boundary scenario would look like Could. if only one Could. consideration were in play. Um, they were also meant to show how difficult it would be to optimize um, all six of the considerations that are in our policy so people have a, um, a good understanding of what we're trying to do to, to get a, uh, an optimal blending of these um, considerations. Uh, we've gotten a lot of comments and emails about these so-called proposals, and I, I want to point out that they're not really proposals. They were illustrative examples, and that uh, given the feedback from the community, um, the next round, which will be on October 25th and 26th, really are the beginning of the proposals. There will be draft proposals from the feedback that was worked into uh, what we've already seen. So I just want to say again to everybody who's listening, um, those were not proposals. Proposals are coming up. Um, appreciate how difficult it is to try and blend all six of these things into, you know, something that works for everyone because virtually every uh, email or um, discussion or phone conversation we get, uh, people are, have landed on one consideration as the one thing that's the most important, of course, to them, but it changes depending on who you talk to. So. Um, a better blending of a better um, uh, meshing of these considerations are coming up next week and I'm as anxious to see them as everybody else in the community. I was wondering if I could make a comment Please. on Mr. Goldstein um, and kind of uh, refine a little bit of what you've shared. Uh, I think one of the things that we've learned as we've moved through with a number of these processes is that we solicit a community input uh, and that input really guides uh, staff with what recommendations come forward. Whenever we bring it forward as an information item, it's a combination of that input coupled with staff's guidance or best recommendation. There are subsequent then opportunities for the community to weigh in whether it's a part of the agenda, whether it's part of a uh, public hearing process, actually pretty parallel to what we do with the budget. 
and then ultimately the board, based on all of that information, will come to some type of conclusion. So um, I know that um, you know input is something that we value, and it helps guide staff's analysis. But as you can tell, and as you sort of outlined with those uh, examples, there's a whole host of things that are, need to be factored into whatever decisions or whatever uh, first representation comes forward. And I think helping folks understand that and define that really is the task at hand. And one more. Thank you for the uh, refinement. Um, can you go ahead to slide 10, please? Yes. Um, oh, so you were making a clarification about the uh, some erroneous information that appeared on a slide last week. But uh, I think one of them, and I don't think you did address it in your comments, was about uh, Arlington Tech build out that's planned for this oh, summer yes. I'm sorry, being yeah. on hold. And indeed, it's not on hold. That's right. And, and what I, uh, that further clarification, thank you for that is that in relationship to the Career Center, there are no programmatic changes. And you're right, a, a further refinement is the growth of Arlington Tech uh, will continue. Uh, we have slated for next uh, September an additional 200 students. I know Ms. Chung is here. We are having extensive conversations about that. Uh, the program is on um, you know, the enrollment growth that was slated in the budget. And so we see uh, there's not going to be any um, stall or hold with program growth. We have to have those seats, uh, and the program is something that we're getting good reception on. Good. Thank, I just thank wanted you. to make sure. Yeah, no, thank you. People knew that. I kind of encapsulated it all within one. Okay, thank you. And I'll, um, Your time. I'll yield my time and reserve the right to come back and ask more questions later. Uh, okay, we'll, we'll see how that goes. Uh, Ms. Van Doren. Thank you. Okay, I have a lot of questions about the Ed Center site. Are we prepared for to discuss those? All right. Okay, so the first thing I want to say is that this is an incredibly important decision, as is the one at the Career Center. We made a decision to meet our 2022 seat needs by dividing those seats, the 1,300 we need, between two sites at the Career Center, which we spent an enormous amount of time working on in work sessions, joint sessions with the county board, looking at a, at a charge for a working group to really look at what we're going to do there in a really systematic way that will include the community and the county. Mm -hmm. Now we're at the Ed Center. And I have to say that I think uh, the communication to the community has been minimal on this. Uh, in all of my meetings with uh, community groups, they are unaware of what's going on. So I, I know that it may be that people are overwhelmed, but I think we need to deal with that and we need to figure out how to make sure that what we put, and I'm talking just about the Ed Center now, we need to be as diligent about making sure that the decision we make here is as important and as well thought through as the one we do at the Career Center right. with the same level of engagement. And right now, I don't see that level of engagement with the community. I've gone back now through the uh, reports and the information that we received last year and there is a disconnect between what we received last year and what we're receiving this year in terms of where the board was. I was chair of the board. I followed that process very closely. I followed the winnowing down of options. We got the options from ACI, then there was a survey, and then there was a winnowing down of options. I cannot understand why we have reopened that entire can of options mm -hmm. and taken a group through that again when we were already at a place at the end of last year. So I, I have to say that concerns me. Mm -hmm. um, I, don't, I just don't understand that. And my level of concern is based on the fact that we have a building, we have an opportunity, this building, mm -hmm. to constitute between five and 600 seats in this building at a very low cost at a time when we do not have any other space in Arlington where we have land and a building that already exists that all we have to do is renovate. So between this and the Career Center, we have such an amazing opportunity. Mm -hmm. So with that said, that's why my, my attention on sure. this is like a laser, mm -hmm. because I want to see us do the same due diligence here that we are doing at the Career Center. It's very, very, we are going to live with this decision. Right. We will make this decision, the board will make this decision, mm -hmm. and we will live with this from now on, as we have lived with making other program decisions in Arlington to start new schools or expand programs. So with that said, I'd like to ask the uh, survey results, the 2300 survey, can that 
the results of that survey please be posted online so people can read it. Sure. Yeah, we can, we, we, can, we can get that posted or if it's already posted. Online on the page with the options, with the high school. When was that information posted? Um, earlier this week. Okay, when was the information, the detailed information on this posted on the website? So on the Ed Center process. So the survey results from last February, March have been on the Engage With Us website under the high school options page since last March. As we transitioned to this process, we moved those survey results to the Engage With APS page under the Ed Center instructional options. So it's always been on the Engage page until we moved from looking at locations to looking at the instructional options, it lived there. Now it lives, if you, if you go to the Engage with APS site under Education Center and the work we're doing now, you'll see those survey results there. We've posted the ACI options, we posted those questionnaire results, and we've posted all of the other information from the meetings thus far. Okay, so if someone in the community, finally this week, if someone from the community wants to know what's going on with this project, they can go to the Engage website, to the Education Center page, page and find out who this working group is, what the options were, what the criteria is, the background on the survey, is the ACI information up there as well? Yes, yes. So all, all the background information yes. needed is up there? Yes. Okay. Yes. And a lot of it was up, as I said, with the instructional option when we were looking at sites. So some of that just migrated over from the sites to now the Ed Center page, but all of that is posted, yes. Okay, so now the group that we're using to review the options, uh, it is made up of staff members? Correct. Are there any people outside of staff members in that group? Yes, we have three students, we have our two ACI chairs, and we have one parent who was a part of one of the other, we have a parent as well. You have one parent, yes. elementary, middle, or high? Elementary parent. What age, if you're in what, in, if the schools can open in 2022, that those students would be in fifth grade now? I'm not sure what grade level the fifth grade. students are in so right they're now. Gonna be in fifth, they're in fifth grade now. Sure. So are there any parents <coughs> who will be the consumers of the choice about whether or not they're in this school? Are there any of those parents involved in this process? So the analysis of options where we were narrowing down was intended to be an internal staff process <coughs> taking from the 10 to the two to four options. At this point, we're in a place where we're engaging the entire community in the process. And actually, of the 59 results, a lot of the parents who have responded thus far have preschool or elementary age students, so they are weighing in. And we had those parents there last night. But what you're saying is the working group, which is winnowing the options, has one parent from the elementary level, but that's all. And that is one person in that entire group who would be the consumer of this school. Ms. Van Dorna, I'm going to interrupt for just I want a to second. Be clear. I, I, and I want to be clear as well. This is not a working group. There are different types of, of, of processes that we have set up. And I think we need to be very precise about how we talk about the different processes. Right. What we talked about at um, when the timeline was put up and it's up on the um, PowerPoint now on August 31st, when we looked at all of our processes and set up all of those, um, the very uh, lists that, that Dr. Murphy's been showing with the, f the d different groupings of our processes. We talked about the Career Center process, which is very much about a long range planning process. We're working with the county board because this is about physical, um, the buildings and the planning of the physical site. It's actually not in fact, one of the things we have to talk about is when are we talking about the instructional program for the Career Center when we do all that physical planning. That's the working group is a community working group and we, sa we said it's very complex and we want to have citizen engagement. This process we set up at the August 31st work session to be a staff-led process. Mm -hmm. It's not a working group. I think it's a staff committee, and we have staff committees for a variety of things. Thank you, Dr. Cannon, for, the, for the clarification. However, there have been external people to the staff working group added. I'll just list my questions, because I have significant concerns about this process. The options, we've opened that can up again. Weighted criteria, I think that's on the website. I think everybody needs to take a look at that. I have questions about that criteria. I think that's something the board should have reviewed. The analysis, 
I would like data. I would like to know how many students are enrolled in these various programs, how many we can assume might fill those 500 seats from what different areas. That's the kind of data I'm looking for. Mm -hmm. Not opinions of what people think they might like or think that they might enjoy having here. I want to know, mm -hmm. are we going to be able to fill those seats? Right. And does it, from your educational expertise, does it match where we know we're going? Mm -hmm. I want those two sets of data in a balanced way from all staff members who are involved. That's what I'm looking for. And right now, I don't feel like I have that. Okay, well, let us, let us pull that information together. Uh, we, we, you're bringing this forward in two weeks. Right. And then you're going to ask us to make a decision about the pro. We are going to spend millions of dollars physically renovating this building. We are going to set an educational course for this building for decades to come. And I think that is a very, very important decision. And I couldn't agree with you more. And we are going to be extremely conscientious about the recommendation that we bring forward and allow the appropriate time needed to make that decision. So um, I think we, we are aware of all of these things. And we're not only working with Dr. Natras, but also with Mr. Chadwick, because he also has a relationship here with how the project moves forward. So um, you know, you have our full attention. We know the significance of this. We will not cross this path again for a number of decades. Right. So this de decision needs to be right. Many of the decisions that we're making have ramifications in decades. And so um, a lot of these decisions will play themselves out, of the, uh, out over a course of 20 to 30 years. I have three last comments. One is I hear very little conversation about cost of these options. And it doesn't sound to me like that was factored in here. And that very much concerns me. Uh, we really have to work on our communications. When I do go out and I do discuss with community groups that, that this is important and they need to pay attention, yeah. they hear it and they do. And I, I think we are doing a great job with Engage. I think the community is overwhelmed. People are profoundly grateful for all the hard work we're all doing. Um, so I just think we have to figure out how do we right now tweak the community's interest to focus on this. Right. Because we need to do that because we don't need to be somewhere as we're planning six or eight months from now and have a upset community that was unaware that we made such an right. important decision. But, but I want to circle back on something that I know you bring up all the time and I know you can poll uh, staff here as well. Uh, we will be within budget, whatever program or recommendation, and we need to stay within that budget with whatever program or recommendation that we come forward with. That would be from a facility standpoint, because there are certain limitations that this facility has, as well as programmatically. So we have a, a strong awareness, and that sort of crosses the universe of the organization, as well as with capital programs, with some of the uh, recommendations we've had in relationship to policy. And I know Mr. Chadwick, as well as Ms. Peterson, have a keen eye on that as well. And they know how strong the board feels about it, and they know how strong I feel about it. So um, while that may not be highlighted this evening or it may not be evident, um, that is definitely in the background and a strong element that's playing itself out. Uh, one thing that I've heard loud and clear in my civic association meetings is a concern about our escalating costs in the school system and the need to have a sustainable budget. And we approved a look at making sure we have a sustainable budget, which is why I don't think we can ever divorce a conversation between what we might like to have and the cost, so I really appreciate your doing that because it's very, it's not just a matter of what we can afford right now in terms of the building that we actually put in here, but can we sustain what we put into this building? And but that's, I know I, that you know I, that's I, important. I know that, but I also have to highlight that's what guided us bringing this recommendation exactly. forward yes. for this facility because it was existing. Right, and we were, uh, I, w I right. continue to be extremely excited by this mm -hmm. and consider it one of the best decisions we've made that mm -hmm. I've been involved with mm -hmm. and I want to see that to fruition right and I'm very invested in this and making sure we do the right, right thing for the community and for our kids right. and that we serve the parents and the, the kids who are coming into this not necessarily parents right. who are leaving it the last thing is this is one of the first times in the recent years that we're making an instructional decision. Mm -hmm. And I think going forward, we need a framework like we have a CIP framework. Mm -hmm. We need to have an instructional decision-making framework mm -hmm. that 
what that's going to be with the board, a check-in, and a final point on that. I, I, I really urge us to do that going forward so there are no surprises. Great work for our strategic planning committee. There you go. Mr. Lander. Uh, quick question. Uh, one, just for clarification purposes, because I have been talking about this. This process that Dr. Nash, you have engaged in, this, we approved this process, correct? So yes. this did come before the board, and the steps that you are taking are in alignment with what the board approved. I also wanted to have a follow-up with regard to the um, serving as the facilities liaison, and I had informed the folks on facilities that uh, after the internal process in which we are now happens, that the conversation about facilities, um, renovation, costs, and all those things that the uh, facilities advisory committee would have an opportunity to weigh in when that time comes in the uh, sequence. Uh, sequence of, uh, I was going to say priorities, mm -hmm. but sequence of priorities that we have. And so can we just uh, 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 overtly state that because I have been telling folks this is an internal process. We haven't gotten to the second part of this where community members, especially the fact that I am liaison to, will be weighing in. But when that portion comes, there will be a fact opportunity to weigh in as far as the renovation and construction goes. Can we just state that overtly, please? Yeah, and what I might do, and I'm channeling uh, Dr. Emma Villon Sanchez, she used to say, elaborate. So I think in my next report, we'll kind of elaborate the time schedule beyond once the board makes an uh, the decision, the instructional decision about then how that falls out. And that'll be parallel with all of our projects like we've done with Fleet right. or doing with Reed as far as how we move forward. And I know that's something that Mr. Chadwick is pressing for to get that decision and then be able to uh, right. begin and to schedule the, the construction. And I appreciate that because one of the reasons why I try to um, advocate for the facilities advisory committee slowing down a little bit is because we have so many projects going on mm -hmm. and adding another one mm -hmm. I didn't think would, would, would stretch the bandwidth of, of, of mm -hmm. facilities and not be able to provide thoughtful input. So I just wanted to make sure that folks are reassured that we didn't skip any steps. This is something that we did approve and that we're moving through uh, we're, diligently. So we're thank coming you. around the corner. Excellent. Mr. Goldstein has asked for a quick moment. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, so I, I was curious about the weighting criteria and how we came up with them. And one of the curiosities was that um, they all seem to be between 5 and 10. And um, so I'm kind of wondering what happened to one through five, or are you do, using a different you know, numbering system? And then, presumably, uh, you took each option and you multiplied it by the weighting criteria. And well, why don't I let you explain? Yep. So at one of our first meetings with the internal group, we first talked about what are all of the potential things that we really want to consider as we're going through this process when we think about instruction. And so that was the first list. And then once we had that list, these are intentionally weighted. They're not ranked because there can be some things that hold equal weight. And because it was a list of what are all of the things that we should consider as we're making this decision, you would very rarely see a one through five because they all have some degree of importance when we're thinking about it. It's just to what degree of importance. So had we used a scale of one to five, there would have been some ones, but we used a scale of one to 10. Um, and so you can see like the one that's a five competitive with other school divisions is only five. So it's not nearly as important as program access and equity because part of our work is to make sure whatever we um, place here, students have equal access to. So you don't see the one through five, first of all, because it's a weight, not a rank. And second of all, because everyone felt like, and this is done when you do it in a group, this is actually called a TRIGO process, which is a decision-making process. There's actually a name for it and you go through. But um, within that process, you have an individual weight, then you have a small group weight, and then you have to come to consensus as a large group to the degree of importance. And so these are the weights that the group came up with. And then somewhere there is some 
product. There is. So what we're going to provide for you, and this gets at what Ms. Van Doren was speaking to earlier about wanting to see the data behind it. Um, through this process, what we determined was the things that are weighted um, are going to shift depending upon the program. The logistics are going to have to be in place no matter what program we pick. And so the logistics are really data. What would the staffing cost be for a STEAM program? What would the staffing cost be for IB? Because expanding IB means additional staff training. And so what we will provide for you is actually a spreadsheet very similar to what we provided when we were going through the selection of the locations that has, okay, so the complements the current program or fills a needed gap. Does it meet the criteria, partially meet the criteria, or does not meet the criteria? And then that one, two, or three is multiplied by the eight to get us the weight involved with it, and then we give the rationale. So I know um, folks are really waiting for the rationale and what's the data that's behind that, and we're actually finishing that up um, now, and then we'll get that to you in a spreadsheet very similarly to what we did when we were looking at the options. It, no, thanks. And uh, presumably, uh, every one of the 31 people on the committee voted through the weighting criteria for their, or, or weighted each of the 10, and that's how you came up with the four of the 10 options? From the 10, yeah. we narrow to four based on this weighted criteria, yes. Oh. So we weighted all of the 10 options. What we're gonna give you is we had these 10 options, we weighted the criteria, then we decided does it not meet the criteria, partially meets or meets, and then there's a big spreadsheet that has each of the 10 that I didn't actually share with you tonight, but like one of them was uh, technology high slash STEM, and it didn't get as high of a score as the other four. Um, so we brought forth the four highest scoring options based on these criteria. So yes, is the answer, the short answer is yes. And all of the people on the committee voted. I mean, they all, so, they all took these weighting criteria against all 10. Yes. And then, the ones that that yes. that rose to, that the, rose to yes. the top were you the four. It. Yes. Okay. Thank you. I don't want to go down <laughs> the road too much on that one. Um, the early college, I was confused by. Um, it could be non-college also. I mean, you don't have to be going to college to 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 take advantage of. You're going to get your. You come out with an associate's degree, yeah. and so the beauty of it is, is the the beauty of it is for those who are interested, you have our students can come out with a higher education degree and immediately enter the workforce more prepared, or pursue an academic degree only left with two years to obtain your bachelor's degree. And for someone like myself, that would have been a phenomenal opportunity. Uh, considering my income, um, my income status at the time in my uh, personal experiences. So, uh, just so that people understand the the greatness of something like this, uh, not that you know, and I don't have a position on any of this. Although, I just I'm always looking for opportunities that provide a lot of um, great opportunities to a variety of different learning styles and students' needs. So. And I, I think, Ms. Talento, the only thing I would add to that, and you alluded to it, but I'll sort of underline it, is the financial costs of post-secondary educational opportunities. And if we can provide that early on for students here, if they elect to transition not to the workforce but to uh, additional post-secondary, then they will have only a two-year financial obligation uh, that they'll be looking at if they want to pursue a four-year. So the idea of some of the um, uh, you know, the pressures that post-secondary uh, tuition brings to families and individuals, they won't have that burden, hopefully, if, they, if we were able to pursue this. So that's, that's a big asset to that, uh, that approach. Okay, thank you. Um, I have one more question. It does have 16 subparts, though, so <laughs> you're asking. Um, the questionnaire period that we're in now is going to 
conclude on November 1st, but then on November 2nd, we're going to be getting a recommendation, mm -hmm. which seems awfully, awfully tight. So that was the lead in, the sub part A. And this, I think, is my biggest question. Will the community's response at this point in this current uh, questionnaire interval determine the recommendation? And I think that goes back to what I shared with my comments earlier this evening when I said I'd like to refine a little bit what you said. What we're doing is we're setting up listening posts for community input. We take that all into consideration. Staff uses its best professional judgment to then make a recommendation based on community input and also the expertise that staff brings in the variety of areas to bring the board the best recommendation, factoring in all of the um, different variables that are out there. Cost is a huge driver that we have to be uh, aware of and sustainability and does it complement or uh, you know is it similar in some ways to some of the other programs so all that has to be put into the mix and objective so this is where we get into a little bit of tension uh, sometimes are we voting no we're not voting we're listening and we're also allowing for input to help guide staff's best recommendation Good, but that makes that period between November 1st and November 2nd even tighter, even busier, because if you have to not yeah. simply add up the, the comments exactly. that came from the community, you have to uh, lay your professional expertise and judgment over it. Um, I'm uh, hopeful that we'll be able to see something on the 2nd that's um, a product of people who haven't had sleepless nights. Yeah, and if we have to, we may have to come back to you uh, with um, a slight adjustment uh, with timelines. So I think we've got a little bit of flexibility in the schedule, but that'll be something I'll have to speak with, with staff about. And I think that's, that's duly noted. Um, you know, we, it's not unusual for us also to expand timelines slightly to make sure that we've captured uh, you know, a, a complete understanding and input from the community. So I think we're open to that. I think we've got some flexibility. Uh, our, our, I'm barometer, gonna, uh, our barometer on that is watching to see whether Mr. Chadwick falls out of his chair when the, <laughs> the question of stretching the timeline gets mentioned, and he didn't. So, so there might be there might be a little bit of wiggle room. Mr. Goldstein, have you seen uh, this is Spinal Tap? Uh, yes, I have. The speaker that goes all the way to 11. Yes. You know, the speaker's louder than the others because it goes all the way to 11. Yeah. Uh, one you started it. <laughs> Own it. <laughs> We're talking about scales. Scales 1 to 10, 1 to 5. Okay. You know, they're, All right. I'm going to suspend uh, scales, subpart C through M here. One last, and, one um, last question from Ms. Van Doren. Did you really have more? No. No. Oh, okay. no. Ms. Van Doren. One, I, one I have a request. Okay. I have a request. I said that was, I think this is an incredibly important decision mm -hmm. and, and <coughs> it, it matters a lot to our community because Absolutely. we're tight for space, we're tight for programming, we have high expectations, mm -hmm. we want it to be a good decision. I, don't, I think there are probably lots of good decisions. Mm -hmm. um, I want to see the data. I want to see the analysis mm -hmm. and I would like you to share that with the board and as soon as you have data and analysis that you can post that really analytically says what might be the mm -hmm. participation in any of the options, put it up mm -hmm. so that we know that we're not, we want, I believe, I hope I can speak for my colleagues, we want to base this decision on good, solid information so that when we go out to the community and say, we made this decision, here's why. It's not just, I like it, or lots of people voted for it because my kids want you know, lots of stuff that I can't do. Yeah. We, we have to bring all it together. So give me the data, give me right. the analysis that's really balanced from a variety of different perspectives, including the community input, but I really do need that expertise with the cost, mm -hmm. but give us that basis. And the more time you can give us to analyze it and mm -hmm. look at it and get comfortable with it, 
the better. And I am not a big advocate for putting things off. We all are trying to help, you know, pull together and get everything done we have to this year. I'm not suggesting that. I just, to, to be rushed in a decision and trying to digest that information and help the community digest mm -hmm. it is a challenge. Right. And, and I'll just uh, say that's the whole idea behind the input piece. I think there can be a lot of input for something that's not going to fill seats and we need to fill seats. At the end of the day, that has been the discussion. We need to have uh, programs or schools that fill seats. So we cannot waste one seat uh, and not have it filled. And that is very clearly in the back of my mind and staff's mind. Dr. Murphy, you are all being very patient. You know, this, our schedules are so busy and we have so many processes that we don't have a chance to schedule a special work session on each of them. Mm -hmm. So essentially, board members have a lot of detailed questions because mm -hmm. we don't have a work session where we're covering this topic. So yeah. we appreciate your patience. There is one more um, comment from Ms. or question but from I, Ms. I wasn't Chalant. done. I, oh, I wanted sorry. to go back to the Career Center. Uh, thank you very much for clarifying those two points that Arlington Community High School is at the Career Center and it's not moving. And Arlington Tech, the, the plans to expand that and expand the facility to incorporate the additional seats, that is on track mm -hmm. because there will be students applying for that program mm -hmm. and they need to know right. for sure that we have not wavered in the least in our commitment to right. growing and strengthening that program. And the last one is we voted to put 800 seats at that site mm -hmm. by 2022. That's our commitment, regardless of, of that's a component of the Career Center Working Group. Right, and, and, and I, I just have to say, this comes up all the time. It's in the CIP. It's a plan. You voted on it. We've dedicated the money to it. It's happening. It's happening, okay? Dr. Murphy, It's a decision sure? the board made. <laughs> just, just want to be sure. Yeah. Okay. Ms. Talento. So those seven to 800 seats, they're happening. I'm just kidding. Okay. Um, I just wanted to, uh, my I have one follow-up, but I, I, I have to remind myself that uh, we are public, we're elected officials or public figure, and I put in a really great pitch for early college, and I'm going to put in a really great pitch for all other three because I really think they're phenomenal. Um, and just to finish my pitch on early college, it also provides our gifted students an opportunity to take rigorous courses that they might not have available in a traditional high school curriculum. The Creative and Performing Arts High School is a dream of mine. Um, I was a dancer, and I, I'm going to bring my personal story because it's how I relate to people. I was low income. There was a visual performing arts program in my high school. The teacher said to me when I auditioned, I would have to take ballet classes over the summer to be in the program. I could not afford ballet classes. Well, I do a lot of type of dance, dancing. Oh. <laughs> Mo I do modern dance and salsa and merengue, and I teach salsa and I took ballroom, just to be very clear on the, um, the, my, my art. Um, but again, I could not afford to take ballet classes, and my dad was a part-time cab driver, and I couldn't get to the studio. So I found other ways through the school to do some of that and through extracurricular activities. Uh, I actually did Colombian folklore for a uh, Colombian group from South America. Um, the arts program is a phenomenal opportunity for many of our students who are truly gifted in the arts, and I personally do not think it takes away from the arts in our traditional high schools because there are students who love that art, whether it's drawing or music playing or dancing or gymnastics or anything of the sort, but they don't want to focus on it as a career. And the IB program, well, how do you not say enough about the IB program? It's an incredible program. It provides you opportunity nationally. Um, it's you know something that our community loves. And STEAM is just a combination of arts and technology. I'm a math girl. I think math is an art form. When you take numbers and you're able to create ideas from numbers and you're able to manipulate numbers to show you what you want to believe, that is art. But yet, if you dig into the roots of those statistics, Numbers are dependable, and those are facts, and that is technology, and that is how we are sitting in this building without it falling over on us. So I'm excited about the potential options here at the Ed Center, and I look forward to the feedback and my comment. Now that I've done my pitch for all these amazing programs that our community has, uh, that our internal process has narrowed down, uh, in our meeting yesterday evening, which I was getting feedback from some of our community leaders, we noted that the Ed Center, uh, uh, the Ed Center com 
uh, communication on the Ed Center meeting last night was not clear. And what we realized is it was in two APS school talks that I saw, at least two, maybe three, but they were under the middle school boundaries. So the majority of our parents saw the middle school boundary information and stopped reading. And some of the ideas that they came up with was maybe when we send those APS school talks, instead of sending one individually per process, because we have so many, is that at the very first line, we list whatever is in that email. So for instance, if we're gonna update on the inclusion one -to -one po the inclusion policy or the one-to-one -one policy or the Ed Center, the first four things you see is APS school talk, one, two, three, four, and then the information in order. It was a suggestion. Um, we are trying to refine our communications, but we are really working hard this year to communicate with our community and bring them along as we move through all of these processes. And I know that Mr. Golson and I and a lot of my other school board members have met with their PTA presidents uh, to make sure that they're able also to have this information to disseminate to their membership in case we are not able to make their PTA meetings on time um, early on in the year. So. Thank you for allowing me the time at the mic again. And I'm, and I'm just gonna finish something because I was cut off and not finished. Okay, but- Dr. Me, Murphy. Just let me finish. Go ahead. Uh, just, let me, just let me finish my sentence. So thank you for allowing me the time on the microphone. Dr. Murphy, in the materials that were presented on the 26th of September and October 11th, the 800 seats were not mentioned. And the importance of that, and I understand that you feel that we voted and we have to do it, the importance of it is that it is in addition to the seats that are already at the site. Mm -hmm. And that has been a confusing point for mm -hmm. many members of the community. Right. So to reiterate it and assure people, right. we have to go out and talk to the community mm -hmm. who are very nervous about high school seats mm -hmm. and making sure we have enough. Right. So reiterating consistently as lots of plans are changing, mm -hmm. that we're committed to doing that is an important thing to do in our communications. I understand that. All right, thank you very much. And again, this is sort of like our pseudo work session on this topic, so it did, it did stretch a little bit out, um, but we got a lot of important work done. So thank you very much. Thank you for um, being responsive to all of our questions. And we will now move on to the next item, which is an update on the graduation task force. Dr. Murphy. <laughs> thank you. Uh, I'm gonna turn this over to uh, Dr. Laura Newton, our Director of Student Services, and she's also joined by uh, Ms. Karina Cornell uh, and Ms. Margaret Chung, and they're gonna speak to uh, where we are with uh, some of our dropout efforts. Uh, I also wanna thank them, as well as a number of our high school principals for the work that we've been doing. Uh, I think we've got a number of challenges. The board received information about this last spring. Uh, much of this information from between uh, last spring and now has not changed, but this is a very appropriate for us to bring this forward to the community uh, as a result of the, the reporting process that occurred here in September, or the latter part of September. So I'll turn it over at this point to Dr. Newton. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Murphy, and good evening, honorable school board members. Um, I'm Laura Newton, I'm the Director of Student Services, and with me tonight is Mrs. Margaret Chung, not Karina. She's just here in the audience. Great, the yes. great Mar Margaret Chung. <laughs> but she's our wonderful principal at the Arlington Career Center, so she uh, and I will provide you with an update on the Graduation Task Force. I want to start by giving you a short um, background on the Graduation Task Force. It was started in, uh, in 2010, and it was meant to analyze best practices uh, to help our students graduate on time and to do research on ABC on dropout prevention to help them stay and remain in school. The National Dropout Prevention Center reviewed our best practices and made several recommendations. The first one was at the system level to use early identification of students at risk of dropping out through data. Second, at the school level, to use the Arlington um, tier systems of support, support to provide uh, services to meet the needs of the whole child. And third, to continue to engage community support to meet the needs of our families and our students. So the next slide gives us a summary of these best practices. 
um, that we have right now at Arlington Public Schools, and we have them at the system level, school level, and community supports. And just to name a few, because you have them in front of you, we're generating daily attendance reports and monthly dropout monitor reports. And this is important information that our uh, dropout prevention teams at each of the schools are digging in and really looking into it to see what are the needs or needs of our students. So we are really concentrating on academic, like tutoring and dual enrollment, and also um, social emotional, because that's very important. And so we are providing mental health uh, services as well as wraparound services. Um, in alignment with meeting the needs of the whole child, we provide wraparound services to ensure that our students are healthy, safe, engaged, supported, and challenged. And so we have partnered with our community agencies and institutions to provide essential services, such as clothing and food, and dental care, vision care. Uh, we wanna provide them with civic and leadership training and work, up, um, and work opportunities for them. Our next um, slide talks about AP on-time graduation rate, and um, Margaret will continue to uh, lead us to the next few slides with the data points. Thank you, Laura. Thanks to the school board's ongoing support and strategic focus on the whole child, our on-time graduation rate is holding steady at close to 91% and shows an overall positive trend over time. I would like to note that as a school district, our student enrollment has increased. Therefore, as shown in the blue section of each bar, the number of students in each cohort for on-time graduation has also increased from 1,320 in 2009 to 1,541 in 2017. I would like to preface the following slide by indicating that the number of dropouts represented here are a snapshot in time. The numbers listed are counting the total number of students in all grade levels in high school who stopped attending school for that given cohort year. The 101 students listed in 2017 do not include the students who have since re-enrolled in school by September 30th of this year. The adjusted dropout numbers for 2017 will be published by the state in November. It is important to note that APS did experience in recent years a surge of newly arrived immigrant students, many of whom are unaccompanied minors with significant interrupted schooling. Many of these students leave school when they turn 18, citing as their reason as needing to work full time. Thanks to our alternative programs such as Langston and the Hilt Institute and Arlington Community High School, students can pursue a high school diploma with flexible scheduling, smaller class sizes, and considerable wraparound services, as mentioned by Laura. Here we have the on-time graduation rates disaggregated by students identified as students with disabilities, economically disadvantaged, and limited English proficient. It is the colors that correspond to the four line graphs. The on-time graduation rates for each subgroup are 96.2% for economically disadvantaged, 93.3% for students with disabilities, and 74.4% for limited English proficient students. It is important to note that 2017 is the first year that WIDA level six students are included in the LEP graduation rates. Up to level five students were included in the previous years. Here, the on-time graduation rate is disaggregated by race and ethnicity. Students identified as Asian are at 94.7%, Black, 91.8%, Hispanic, 78%, 0.1% and white 98.3%. The overall trend over time for all subgroups is positive. Many of the district's students who are identified as limited English proficient are of Hispanic origin. And now Laura. <laughs> 
So moving forward, uh, we really want to continue with our targeted interventions. We know that early identification of students that are at risk of dropping out is through data is essential. Um, so checking their attendance and monitoring monthly dropout rates is extremely important to provide um, the services that they need. We need to continue to implement Arlington Tier Sisters of Support um, through the whole child uh, in meeting uh, their academic and social emotional needs. The dropout prevention team supports are so essential, making sure they're digging out into our data and making sure that we are providing the interventions that our students need in order to be successful. What we notice is that we need increased social work and school psychologist supports um, in order to make sure that their students are receiving the services that they need. We need to strengthen the supports for our English learners. As Margaret said, there's many students that come in with interrupted education, and they do need additional time and support in order to graduate. So that means that we need to strengthen our, our multiple instructional and graduation pathways, pathways, dual enrollment, flexible schedule, in order for them to meet the graduation requirements. Um, this means created individual plans. So we cannot have general plans. We need to really meet individually with the students to find out what is their personal situation, what is their educational uh, background in order that to create a plan that will work for them and meet graduation requirements. And we need to assure that we uh, um, help them make the transitions as they move from school to school and also make the transition to their future endeavors, whatever that is going to be. Um, we need to increase our community involvement. So we need to have uh, integration of community supports to include more mental health services. That is a key issue at the moment. And we also need to provide additional employment and workforce opportunities. So we want to thank you, and we will try to answer any of your questions that you have right now. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Mercado, are there any speakers? No speakers. Uh, board colleagues, questions, comments? I just want sure, to say thank Dorn. you very much, Dr. Newton. I know you've been here for a, a little bit over a year. A little over a year now, and welcome back. And thank you for doing the presentation. It was excellent, and I really appreciate your work. So well, thank you, thank you that for, to all of the presenters, to Ms. Chung, as always. And I, w I want to ask you questions like, why are they dropping out? But you answered that question. And, and I know that we're doing all we can to keep provide the services we can for students. And I do also believe that you told me before that some of the students are coming back, even though they have dropped out. So I love the fact that we continue to welcome them back into Arlington Community High School, the GED program. So. Thank you for doing that. Thank you very much. Ms. Talento. Yes, thank you uh, for the information and for the explanation. I really appreciate it. Um, so I had, I just want to, I think I've said this in, in prior meetings, if when we look at some of this data, if we can break it down just a little further and separate out the LEP da data from our Hispanic students because uh, Hispanic students who are born here, one generation, two generation in, sometimes are still being caught in this gap, or and their needs are different than our English language learners. And we're talking about 101 students. It is sad and amazing all at the same time. We're doing well, relatively speaking, but we can save those 101 students too. And by understanding their needs as individual students, by just getting a little more granular in the data, I really think that APS could be an example for the country. So I'll just, that'll be something that I'm probably going to say every time we see these kinds of um, charts. And I do want to make note that we have a lot of African students who consider themselves African American that are different than our black community members, mm -hmm. and they have parallel uh, differences in their needs. Mm -hmm. And so understanding those courts, so I, I, when I, I really would like to get into granular data so we can really address each student individually for their needs. And then I wanted to uh, point out, and, and perhaps you can clarify, the on-time graduation rate is different than the dropout rate. And for people who may not be informed about um, these types of reports, it is different. And so if please clarify or, re or refine my point, but the on-time graduation rate just means they're not graduating in the traditional four years, but they may graduate in five. Mm -hmm. 
Correct. And a lot of our English language learners, when we did the 2012 East Hill evaluation report, showed that a lot of our English language learners do graduate in five years. So those numbers are not necessarily f reflective of our dropout rate. And Is I'm that sure correct? Mm -hmm. So a cohort starts on the when uh, students enter the ninth grade. So, you know, to graduate on time within four years, you have to graduate with your cohort. But we're finding out that English learners and maybe other students is taking them longer to graduate than the four years. So then you have five year and six years, and that's why it's different. But I'm sure Margaret can expand on that. That is correct. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Okay. And, and so <laughs> I do want to note that in the English language learner community and my work with the English language learner community, the longer you stay in school, the higher your chance is of dropping out because you get frustrated. And in the, that we're doing work on that, and when we do our ESL Hill update, we can discuss that more. But just to help the community understand um, some of the challenges that we face with that. And so I just wanted to make sure that I that I would explain to community that I had the right understanding and that we explain that to those watching so that they understand the graduation rate is on-time graduation rate is different than our dropout rate. And if you can bring back the data granularly and um, show me how our amazing efforts that we're doing reflect uh, yes. that. Thank you so much. Mr. Goldstein. Uh, thank you. Um, I, I know you talked about it, but I'm wondering if you have a graphic or something that shows the reasons for dropout may be uh, ranked or something like that because just for future reference, I can go to it and see, I you know, a pie chart or something that shows this reason is that much larger than the other reason or something so like that. We have looked at patterns, and I'm not saying that the only ones, but there seems to be a pattern or kids that turn 18. So especially with kids with interrupted education that come to us, we will see that the majority of them, if they are not English learners, uh, I'm sorry, that if they're English learners, that the high, the, the, the the rate of dropout is higher when they turn 18, um, and it increases as they turn 20. And like Margaret said, many of the reasons is because they have to go to work. Um, also, if you look at the part pattern of how many years they have been with us, when they, you know, if they come to us late and they have an interrupted education, they seem to drop out on the first or second year. And I think it's, it is because they do come with an interrupted education, and it's taking them longer you know, not only to learn English, but to earn the credits. So if you don't create, you know, if they don't understand what it's going to take for them to graduate and how long it's going to graduate, I think the frustration level, they, you know, they hit it pretty soon. So it seems to be a pattern of males, 18, um, that they come here with interrupted education and they drop out after the first or second year, mainly because they see uh, more benefit in working that, you know, in pursuing an education. So like we were saying earlier, and Margaret said, we need to have flexible uh, scheduling and multiple instructional pathways so that even if they have to work, they can continue to, you know, come to school uh, whenever they have the time. Um, so is there a, a graphic? or something that? There is one. Okay. So we will send it to you. Okay, thank you. Okay. Yeah, I'll let you. Can I, I'm gonna take a page out of Mr. Goldstein's book here and um, come so back. <laughs> uh, I, I did notice that there was a draw, um, an increase from 2015 to 2016. And I'm curious if you were able to determine in your in the patterns if, if any of that was related to uh, the immigration policies that took place in the latter part of last year, um, in, in you know where we are today with our current country's immigration policy, with the DACA and um, other enforcement issues. Did you guys notice any patterns? I know we've really tried to reinforce that our schools are a safe place and that we want you to focus on education. But it, there has been concern about that and as we're discussing that, I'm curious if you noticed any of those patterns and if so, what have we been able to do to support those students and reassure them? So I think students for the most part um, view our schools as a safe place. So um, 
the advantage to having these alternative, our alternative programs um, is in the smaller environment, it, it has a very family-like atmosphere. And so they have that sense of connectedness. And we find with our most vulnerable population, um, having a personal relationship um, with the schools keeps them in school. So I, I feel like that's become our emphasis, especially with the school board's initiative with the whole child, uh, with increased staffing around social services. It's really helped us and equipped us at being able to provide the level of support that many of our students need. Terrific. Thank you so much. I just want to follow up on uh, uh, Ms. Talento's point about the difference between on-time graduation and just plain graduation. Um, and I know that, so graduation, uh, we, you showed us the uh, dropout rate, um, which are basically those who are not going to graduate. So um, actually, uh, uh, well, they do too. So they, they come the back. dropout numbers, represent students who during that given cohort year have stopped coming to school. Some of them do return. So for instance, this current year, the 101, that was the number that was recorded at the end of June. Those numbers are then recounted by September 30th. And the number then, which will be posted, will occur in November. Of the 101, it won't ever, it won't increase, but of those several, so for I, I can say, like at the Career Center, two of the students have already returned. <coughs> so they, the number will go down. Okay, so, so this, it doesn't number, have to do this with, number is smaller than the number correct, in the bar graph that the haven't bar, graduated on time. Yes. And you're saying the ultimate number of those who will never graduate is even smaller than the than that number. Right, so this number just represents the number of students who stopped attending school right. during that, at that given moment in time. It, it shifts because they come in and out, they re-enter our school system. So that is very different than the number of students who earned right. a diploma by that given school year. Right, yeah. all of which, and again, you know, earlier in the evening, Dr. Murphy mentioned that a lot of school districts, districts in Virginia are not like us. Personally, whether you graduate on time or graduate a little later, I think in Arlington is the same thing. I mean, we, because we're providing the services. I mean, there are other parts of the state that perhaps if you don't finish high school on time, they don't have a way for you to continue, but we do. Correct. So this is one of several examples where we do our, ourselves a disservice by not advertising what we actually do. We're reporting what the state asks us to report, which is on-time graduation. But the truth is we have a better number. Yes. And I don't know, I, why do we not advertise it the way we, I mean, we have to report to the state, sure, but why do we not advertise this the way it truly is? Can, can we maybe do that? <laughs> I, I mean, you know, because we're sort of saying this, but, you know, sure. this, is, this, is, this represents what we do, and, yes, and, and I think we should, we should explain it the way it really is. So, um, and then but, the other- Dr. Cannon, the fact is that when you go to the state website, this is how it's reported. So we can yes. explain it one way, but, the, but then right. we will have to I, be explaining to other people that it's different. That's a downside. We explain it, we, we report it to the state, and then we'd be, look like we'd have a different number, but we, call it, we can call it something different too, because it is, it is something different. Um, and I also just want to mention, and, and you uh, were mentioning the, the personal support, and, 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 and I think it was on one of your um, slides about psychologists, social workers, and the things that do help. And just want to remind all of us that we are continuing rolling out more psychologists, social workers, counselors for English language learners. Um, all of which we're in the second year only, starting the second year of a three-year rollout of more of those resources. So that will hopefully really pay off as well. That's good. And I really right want to this. thank all of you for the additional psychologists and social workers. We really appreciate it, and they are making a difference. And, so and finally, you. the um, I think our HILT program is growing at the Langston program, and that's that's another place where we're we're serving those kids. So, yeah. Yeah, so terrific. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, have a good evening.
We have one more monitoring item, and it is an update on our minor construction and major, major maintenance projects. Dr. Murphy. Yes, I'm going to turn here to uh, Mr. Jim Meikle and Mr. Mike Frieda, and this is in relationship to the Board's interest about some of these projects. Um, this is part of the, uh, uh, the annual budget as well as uh, the capital improvement plan, and so um, I think these gentlemen will kind of share with you some of the work that's being done, also the number of projects that we're being able to move through. I will highlight that a majority of this work does occur during the summer uh, as a result of the, the, you know, just the timing and the availability of our schools, and I want to thank them for being patient this evening and waiting to this part to uh, share their presentation. So, Mr. Meikle, I'll turn it over to you. All right, good evening. Uh, so we're here to give a, a brief update on uh, maintenance projects and funds. We're mainly focused on MCMM. Um, that is minor construction, major maintenance. I'll say it once because it will be repeated many times and will be much shorter if it's MCMM. So you know what it is. I'm here with Mike Frieda, my colleague from finance, uh, who helps us through this programme and guides us through the, the fiscal part of it every year. And John Giambarvo, who is the liaison to the Facility Advisory Council, and he's just gone through one full cycle. And John's going to talk a little bit to the process for us. Uh, so we'll start by giving you a, an overview on the funding streams, and uh, for that, I'll hand over to Mike. Thank you, Jim. Uh, I'm going to give a brief uh, overview of the funding streams that we have for our maintenance programs, and then lead into our MCMM program. Uh, first, we have our our bond programs, our our bond funding that goes for our programs that are projects in the range of one to five million dollars. These are for projects such as HVAC, roofing, and other infrastructure renewal projects. Um, these are uh, projects that can be par uh, integrated into uh, an overall um, renewal project like we've done at the Ashlawn or McKinley projects, or they can be standalone projects like we're doing right now for the Gunston HVAC and the Randolph HVAC. Uh, the second type of funding we have is from the general operating budget, and these are current funds or current revenues that we have for the smaller and routine maintenance items that we do throughout the year. And then additional funding sources comes from grants and PTAs. Uh, we get considerable funding from grants, and uh, Mr. Meikle's uh, team's done a, a real good job in receiving grant fundings for security improvements in our schools. Uh, from time to time, we do get PTA funds, and these are generally used for beautification projects such as planting trees or maybe providing benches. And now that leads into the MCMM uh, funding, and that is between our major bond funds and our routine funds. This is for projects that are generally over 15,000 but less than 500,000. And this all comes from current revenue or current funding. There are no bond funds in the MCMM fund. Um, and as you know, th that's the general funding sources. And as you know, that the finance department provides you with a status report of all capital projects on a quarterly basis. Jim? So we'll quickly just give you a few examples of the, um, of the type of uh, projects we do through MCMM. Uh, I won't read them all here. Typically, we start the year by getting enough funding placed for a relocatable and minor internal conversions that year um, to produce the extra seats that we need beyond new buildings. Um, and then we have the, the standard programs, painting schools, uh, floor coverings is, is a big item for us, new gym floors and so forth. And we'll touch in a little bit of detail on these um, a little bit later on. Um, we have a, a number of system-wide programs. Um, these are some examples. Uh, and you'll note uh, what happens with a lot of these programs is we will use MCMM to get them introduced to the system. And hopefully within a year or two, we'll transition them as appropriate over to our operational funds as we are able to do that uh, with, a, with the operational funding stream. I am not going to go through this entire chart. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Jim Valvo will talk a little bit to the process. Yeah, the key point for us is in uh, November, hopefully by late November, we go to ELT and Dr. Murphy 
with a recommendation for our MCM programme for the year after going through this programme. Um, let me touch on the committee makeup. This is the committee makeup for MCMM. And um, the one external member is, is John. And he's just gone through a full year of this process, so we thought it might be appropriate for him to give an overview on what he's seen in the process. I'll flip back in case this helps while he's talking. Thank you. Um, I won't try to explain all that, but um, being on this for the first year uh, last year, uh, I was very impressed. I've done similar type of work in other municipalities, and I was very impressed at how Arlington and staff goes through this. It was a logical, professional process, uh, compares favorably to everything else I've seen. It was objective. They had, um, we had meetings where I felt that everyone's interests as all the schools were represented. You had a principal representing all the high schools, all the middle schools, and all the el elementary schools. There's many variables to balance. Uh, timing, for example. I think someone mentioned earlier, a lot of work needs to get done in the summer when students aren't there. So they can put in the new HVAC or whatever else they need to do. Um, but it's not just that. It's also that certain schools cannot be done that summer because there's programming at those schools, so they have to do it at other schools. So it's, there's a lot of variables they have to uh, work around. Um, and one thing I, I liked uh, how we worked on this last year was how they tried to focus resources on one hand on schools that were already getting work done. So my kids go to McKinley. Um, while the McKinley expansion was being done, they did just about everything they could to that school to get it all done at one time. While you have the construction being done, get everything you, po you possibly can done at one time so you don't have to come back. So there's a focus of resource on those places that are getting work done, but also there was also an attempt to spread out the resources among all the schools. So to make sure that everyone was getting at least something done, something that was a priority for that school. I got the impression uh, from working on this for the first time last year that staff and finance have done a good job at catching up at maybe something I got the impression about a decade ago we fell behind on a number of these things with maintenance and that we're finally catching up um, to some things that were outstanding for some time. Um, it's critical uh, that this continues. You know, this sort of thing isn't exciting like opening a new school, but from my perspective, it's actually more important than opening a new school because this impacts more students and more families. Um, and I would encourage full, adequate funding for this process. Again, it's not as interesting as cutting ribbons, but um, you save money long term by investing now. And I'm really impressed at how staff did this and how you all have funded this. Um, there's a lot that's being done. It would be very easy to lose sight of these less interesting projects. So it was very encouraging as an outsider to see this. Thank you, John. So let us, let us go to the product of all that uh, work that John just talked about, sorry. Um, this is the product that we take to Dr. Murphy and ELT towards the end of November. We've gone through the whole process. We come up with a ranked one to the last item, and we throw in some running totals. So as they discuss it and as it goes through the system, it's a bit easier to find out where your cut might be in a given year. Um, so the cut line is there for last year, and typically what will happen to the projects that fall just under that line, there'll be a there'll be a top priority as we start the process again this year. It doesn't guarantee that they'll be in because they'll compete again with a new batch of products, uh, projects. So um, that's our end product. And that then goes to the, school, uh, to the ELT in November, school board in May, it's incorporated in new recommendations and eventually the county approve at some point. Which means we then have to get start and work in June very quickly to try and have some things ready for August. Um, a few highlights, just very quickly, some relocatable movement this year at five sites, uh, some minor conversions. 
We have had a habit of, sort of going in for the lowest hanging fruit for some fairly simple internal conversions, not highly technical, but ones that have produced a reasonable amount of seats. I think there's about 100 seats produced in those conversions this year. Um, and then obviously it's allowed us to get on with some of these other big initiatives. Um, full disclosure, the playground at Oak Ridge is still being finished due to some weather delays and the fact it overlapped with some um, relocatable um, work there. And some pictures of the projects. Um, the one on the bottom right, the Wakefield Stadium lights, it's the final part of that stadium. Um, now it's a, a great facility and those lights were a joint venture with the county. And that is paid for by a prorated split between ourselves and the county, which is based on one year's of usage before we uh, go to bid. Here's our favourite chart. Um, we think we've been doing a reasonable job with spreading that wealth that we talked about over, over time. And so when we actually did the math for the actual individual projects over a period of 10 years, $46 million, this is what came out. And it's not so much the numbers themselves, but the reasonably even distribution. Uh, we feel quite proud of that. You've seen this one many times in the last few weeks with the Baldridge experience. Um, every year of MCMM is indeed an opportunity to improve. We learn a couple of lessons every year and, and refine the process. A very quick look at the other type of funds, the bond funds. First of all, thank you. Thank you, ELT, Dr. Murphy, school board, and the citizens for supporting these bonds. When I go to regional meetings, we stand up so well against most of our, um, our neighbours in the district in terms of the resources that were being given to do this. So we acknowledge that. Um, <clears throat> and grants, we do very well. We've got a couple of really strong grant writers, Kevin Reardon, who has got us a bunch of security money, as you see. And last week we learned we've got another $45,000 from the state for a couple of more security upgrades at older buildings. Um, Chris Martini and his team with uh, Margaret Chung put together the grant which got us a, a new sp spray paint booth at the Career Centre, which is, is a, I mean, a major step forward for that Arlington Tech programme as it grows. And then we've got some of the smaller stuff. A couple of pictures, the Career Centre new, new spray paint booth, uh, some LED lighting, which has improved the, the Yorktown uh, swimming pool, um, an early start on the, the large project at Gunston on the bottom left uh, with the first few new HVAC units that went in this summer and new windows at Randolph. Uh, there's still a, a section to finish there in the back, but this is a, a big step forward for energy and for aesthetics as well. So I'm not going to read all of these, um, but these are some of the overall improvements that are part of MCMM, part of these bond funds, and all of that combined. Um, the number of requests we get each year has reduced drastically because we believe the schools buy into the fact that we've got a good central analysis system now. Um, the first committee, the first year we had four three-hour committee meetings. Last year we had two two-hour committee meetings. We're finishing most of the projects within the same budget year. It was always a problem carrying forward funds. Um, the funding, it was a couple of million dollars ten years ago, it's now about six, and yet we're still managed to spend most of it. Um, uh, Cathy Lynn takes a big piece of this for the, um, the stormwater management and the, the best in state energy performance, uh, which we won a couple of years ago, and I think we've hit platinum five consecutive years. Uh, professional development, we've done very well with internal progress. Um, we don't rule out bringing in fresh ideas and new blood, and uh, we're already working with the, um, the new team, the non-instructional recruiting team, which is the gentleman who put the bus adverts together. So he's now going to help us with HVAC in the same vein. When we started out on security, um, most of our schools weren't even prepared to take security. So we had to go through every building and basically redo the main entrance. 
Um, that set the stall, and you can see the progress we've made since. And again, I will concede the progress has picked up considerably since we've had a dedicated full-time security officer. Um, a bunch of other projects completed in that period. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention Mark Wazik. Uh, Mark retired in May after 25 years with us, and he was a massive part of getting all these jobs done on time, on budget. So with that, we'll take questions and comments. Excellent. Thank you so much. This is a subject I know of great board interest, so I hope you're, uh, you can stick with us for a while. Yes. Okay, fantastic. Uh, board colleagues, I hope I'm not wrong. Mr. Goldstein. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, so, um, Jim, how do you handle um, MCMM projects that are going beyond completion in 2017? You know, things that are, are bigger or, as John pointed out, you can't do because you have to wait till it, there's an empty building in the summer or something like that, but beyond this year. Absolutely. Well, we're, we're very careful in, in um, focusing on the projects that we know definitively have to be done in that period. We know in some other projects that we can run into the fall and still do work in the background and the ceilings and without in interrupting instruction. So um, that's, a, that's a big part of our approach. Thank you, sir. Perfect. But you do have uh, plans for MCMM projects that for the next fiscal year we and do. Then the so, next so after that. And so we developed as part of this initiative, we developed something called the 10-year plan, and we review that along with the CIP every other year. And so what you'll see is, is the, the subjects, the projects, general descriptions running out 10 years. You'll only see it populate probably for the first two to three years with actual names. And even that can change depending on what, where they need summer school and so forth. So we, we have a 10-year plan that is budgeted. And um, we, um, we, on the bond side, we, we pay that over the 10 years because obviously the bond has a big uh, role in the, the debt service and will inform how much money we've got left to build the new schools. You see, I say that in reverse. But that's not the spreadsheet we saw. About the spreadsheet you saw was the, the recommended projects in order of priority. For, for this year? Yes. Yeah. For this summer, yes. Okay. So um, John brought up the point about uh, concentrating work at the sites where the, the, that are undergoing renovation um, and, you know, building as much as you can in, like in the McKinley example. But um, the downside of that is it makes less money available for big projects at sites that are not undergoing you know right. big renovations yeah. and so i'm sure you can tell that i'm getting around to the randolph example sure so, so let me explain that when we uh, merged some money with ashlawn and mckinley uh, what we did is we had to look ahead at that 10-year plan and we've seen it was there anything in ashlawn and mckinley that looked as if it was on the cards within the next two or three years or maybe even four or five years and said okay is it a close enough call between that and another school to let the other school wait an extra year so we could bring it forward and get it done at the time of the large project? And we think there's some economy of scale in that. Okay. Um, I know we used to have buildings on a 25-year <clears throat> renewal cycle. Right. And we had this conversation when I visited we did. Uh, last year. And then, and that was fine while our enrollment was flat, but then enrollment started to take off and we needed to devote more money to a construction program rather than... Um, right. Yeah, my, my opinion is, is that a component-based system is much more sensible, much right. better informed, because to do a whole school at a time, you'll go in there and there may be some components that have worn particularly well. You know, the, the, just because one floor is 10 years old and another one's 10 years old, they sometimes can wear at different rates for different reasons. So we take that into account. Right, but then it does have, it does leave those buildings that are kind of at the bottom of the renewal list, the ones that have been, have not been renewed for the last 25 years. Right. Um, kind of uh, wanting. 
because a lot of their uh, major systems are breaking down or or something like it, that. It does, but I would hope our um, I hope our pie chart, our favourite pie chart, would explain that we've we've done somewhat of a reasonable job of kind of spreading that around. And well, if true, but there are big, huge, expensive things like you know the the HVAC system right. at Randolph. That so you mentioned, yeah, Randolph is, is scheduled for both HVAC and roofing. And we're still in the process of having that designed, and then we'll decide if we do the roof first or the HVAC first or some combination thereof. And uh, when do you typically make that kind of decision? Well, the project will definitely take place over the next two years. The, th the projects both will take place over the next two years, but the actual order will be determined when we get the final design from the, from the designer, and they're working on that now. It's something you approved at a recent board meeting. Okay, thank you. Okay. Ms. Talento? Um, can we go to slide eight? Sure. Thank you. Thank you for the report, by the way. It was very helpful. Sure. Uh, can you uh, explain to me what happens at the cut line? So, for instance, items number 39 through 43, and it's, that is, sure. does that go on to the next year, or do they have to resubmit a new? They don't have to resubmit. Okay. It goes on to the next year, but it's not automatically approved. It goes in. It will be the first thing we put in after mandates the next again year. Okay. But then it will compete with whatever new requests have come through in that year. And really, when we submit this, we don't know where the cut line will be. It's right. varied from year to year. Right. But again, we've been very fortunate, and that cut line has generally been around $6 million for the last three or four years, which is, is tremendous for MCMM. Okay, great. And, and then, I don't know if this is a question for you or for you and Leslie, but I know that in the past there have been times where we have used money in MCMM and moved it for other budget items and then replaced it again. Does that make sense? I know I've, do you know what I'm speaking? I'm sure I'm just explaining it completely incorrectly, but how does that affect this? And if you can clarify what I'm trying to say. Uh, I think what you're trying to say is that there have been years when we've used a lot of one-time funds to fund MCMM. Yes. Um, that really doesn't affect how much we provide in funding for MCMM. It okay. just affects the funding stream that provides the funding for MCMM. Okay. So we would fund it the same way, just figure out where the funding source would be. I see. So then the, the risk that we run is if we didn't have closeout money one year, we have no way of putting that from that same revenue stream. That That is one of the risks, yes. Okay. Okay, but, okay thank you. That Ms. Van Doren. Mr. Meikle, I would just want to say thank you very, very much. Your, your staff works so hard, as Mr. Jim Bovel said, and uh, we don't thank you all enough for this. Uh, we in Arlington take for granted the phenomenal shape that our facilities are in, and that's because of the work you and your staff do and the, the planning and the prudent use of the funds. Um, I was at a civic association meeting last night and as you recall, 85% of our residents don't have students in the school system, but most of them have been in our schools very recently using them for some activity or another, be it a meeting or an athletic event, uh, a, an arts event, a play. They're there all that they're swimming, and you're doing that. And you're doing it so well with a tight pot of money uh, we go back all the way to Jefferson and your Indeed. your job at Jefferson and bringing that facility along. And just because a facility is old doesn't mean it isn't in great shape. And you keep all of our facilities in great shape. And we don't have to have fancy new ones all the time. And that's, I think, what I heard from our Civic Association. It's great that we have new buildings. It's great that we're doing that. We have to do it. But we're also doing a great job at keeping them in shape. And I just really want to thank you for that. Well, thank you on behalf of our whole team. Sorry, Mr. Lander. I'm facilities liaison, so. You're on top of all I this. Thank you, John you, all the time. You, yeah, so you, we're good. you can talk to him every day. Both of them. Yes, Cause, cause, absolutely, uh, yes. Mr. Giancabo is our coach, uh, uh, vice chair, vice chair. He's and he has his hands full with all the boundary and, and stuff, so. I was, a, I was yes. a little bit curious about that. Does the vice chair always take this role, or did you? I, I wasn't, I, I just started last year, and I, uh, um, they were looking for someone to do it, and I was interested in it. Um, so before right. I became vice chair. Ah, gotcha. Again this 
Yeah, thank you. Uh, so I actually wanted to ask about this slide as well, and uh, Ms. Talento referred to the cut line, and just to confirm, that's based on what we say the budget is. In our, yes. that's, that's all that is, and it was $6 million. Right. Um, and um, there was a quick mention of falling behind at one point, maybe 10 years ago, maybe more recently. We've had $6 million in MCMM for a few years now. Is it the right amount? Is, is, are we cycling at the right pace? I mean, I believe between the MCMM and the bond funds, yeah, we're cycling at as, as good a pace as we possibly could because, again, we have to be respectful that the prime goal is to get enough seats for the kids. And, and when we get bond money, it does affect that debt service you know, ceiling. So we'll appreciate it as long as we can get it. Okay. Let it be noted that you did not ask for more money. That's um, fantastic. May I interrupt here? <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Meikle is absolutely correct. You, we really do a great job here, and the school board really does approve a lot of money for maintenance, and our uh, neighboring jurisdictions at least are jealous of how much we have. But I will say you can never pay, spend enough money on maintenance. And, Certainly. you know, any more would be we would be able to use it to effect. And, you know, the more buildings we get, the more maintenance money we really need to be um, spending particularly as they begin to age after a few years. So we do need to look at increasing that funding as time goes on. That's an excellent point. Thank you. And I did have one more question. You could pull the slide back up, um, sure. the, the same, the $6 million slide. Um, at the top, I think it was the second line, uh, I, I would like to ask about relocatables. Sure. And uh, it looks like last in, in yeah, this particular um, list, $1.5 million was spent. I assume that was spent on leasing or buying new the new relocatables that were installed or what, what is, is that that's that's a combination of um, moving existing owned relocatables um, buying some new ones we haven't we're, we're almost done with buying new ones we think um, and yes and the infrastructure relating to moving some around yeah. also uh, the cost of our internal conversions some of those are just done in-house so they're fairly small costs but some are done by contractors. So here, here's my question, and I know Mr. Meikle knows I'm, what I'm going to get at because we had this conversation. Um, in, a, in 2019, it should be the case that there are a lot of relocatables. We, we, we should finally have more relocatables than we need because when we open the new middle school, we've got 20-some relocatables at Swanson, 20-some at Williamsburg. We're opening an elementary school, so there are relocatables at some of the elementaries. We should have relocatables that we can start moving on out. Do we have a plan? Are we thinking about that? And do we know what we're going to do? And right. I, you know, certainly that should pull off a $1.5 million expense out of this budget. So, so yeah, part, part of the plan, the ultimate part of the plan is when we satisfy all our needs, we went over to owned because we were spending so much money on leased over long periods. And so I think the, own, the, the purchase has been justified. But the ultimate thing we can do is actually sell the relocatables when we're sure that we're absolutely done with them for good. Our relocatables are, are that good, the majority. And we've re re replaced almost all the old ones. We had a conversation about that. We've replaced almost all the old ones. <laughs> People are, I think we have a bitter. <laughs> Mr. Chadwick, did you have a Yes, I, I would like to uh, make sure that it's clear that the, our ability to remove all of the rel relocatables at Williamsburg and Swanson is contingent on the decision the school board makes about how many grades actually move to the new school, the new middle school, the year it opens. That's simply going to be the phasing issue, though. I mean, we, we, we should, we, as we're building, we should be headed Absolutely. toward fewer relocatables Absolutely. for several years going forward. Ms. Talento? I just had a quick question on something that Mr. Chadwick mentioned. When we open up a new school, do we have, I don't know if it would be called a planning factor, for maintenance funds for each new building? Because that makes a lot of sense to me that as we open up a new building, we'll need to consider the cost of maintenance for the HVAC. And so I don't know, I was curious if, if that is something we have or, or how we would do that, or is that something we have to discuss as a board? So, um, so, so I could address or, that in oh, respect great. of Discovery. That's a good example. I mean, oh, in Discovery, you. what they did is they added a line to our budget, an overall line, rather than trying to go into every line of our budget, which is 
30 lines and, and gave us an allowance um, relating to discovery when it came out of warranty. So, so we, we did get recognition of that. Thank you very much. It's really terrific. Great work. Thank you. Thank you. We will now move on to our one action item, which is the Children's School Memorandum of Understanding. The school board is really, really happy to get to this moment. Uh, Dr. Murphy? Yes, I'm going to turn to Ms. Peterson. We have uh, one sh small update as far as this action item, and then I think we'll be ready to vote. Good evening, Madam Chair, school board members. I'm very, very delighted. You have no idea how delighted. I am to be here tonight to update you on the status of the memorandum of understanding with the, with the children's school. Um, it is drafted, and late last night we got final agreement from both sides on the status of the memorandum of understanding. And I just want to reiterate what some of the um, uh, con uh, conditions are in that memorandum of understanding. The first is that we we will move integration station with the children's school to their new location um, next school year, um, their new location on Fairfax Drive. And we will remain with them at that location for two years. We will be paying tuition to, to the children's school for the spaces that we occupy in their school, um, but they have given us a discount. We will pay 75% of the regular tuition rate. And we are currently working together with their designer to um, design the new space um, at the new location so that it is, uh, accommodates all of the needs of our integration station students as well as the children's school students. Excellent. Ms. Mercado, are there any speakers? No speakers. Uh, may I, uh, clarifying questions, if not a mo the motion? I move the board approve the children's school memorandum of understanding with the authors and authorize the chair to sign on the board's behalf. Um, is there a second? I second. Any quick comments before we vote? Conversation? Yep. Yeah, I, I just want to say again to anybody who's listening uh, out there in TB land um, that we've always been interested in keeping our relationship with the, the children's school and in the beneficial uh, relationship of having the integration station, the children's school together. And it's just been uh, a long period of negotiation that has unfortunately, you know, taken this long, uh, even though everybody's got the, the best of intentions to do so. But th that has always been our intent. And fortunately, things have worked out. So I'm happy. Thank you, Mr. Goldstein, that is well put. Thank you so much, Ms. Peterson, for your hard work on this. Are we ready to vote? Yep. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion passes, five to zero. Should we clap on that? All right. <laughs> we will now move on to our information items. And first, we will hear the 2018 internal audit work plan prepared by our Director of Internal Audit, Mr. John McAvice. Thank you, Madam Chair. Board members, Superintendent Murphy, executive leadership team, APS staff, and Arlington community members. I'm here to present our plan for next year, giving you an overview of internal audit at APS, discussing some of the criteria used to select projects, going over some projects selected per our risk assessment process, and also some follow-up on prior year's projects on management actions that have been uh, agreed to. Essentially, internal audit is an appraisal activity to review operations and as a service to the administration of the board. It's a control that functions by measuring the effectiveness and of other controls. As the internal auditor, I provide operational, financial, and compliance audit services to APS and act as an advisor and resource to school leadership and the board, essentially being their person that helps them check to be sure is APS getting all the revenues it's entitled to from whatever sources? Is it paying its expenses in the right amount to the right vendor, to the right person at the right time? And is it doing all this while complying with all the county, state, and federal laws that may govern this? As the Director of Internal Audit, I report to the board 
through the audit committee. This year, it's composed of two members of the board. This year, uh, Dr. Cannon and Mr. Goldstein, the superintendent, and the su superintendent for administration, Cynthia Johnson. So those four individuals make up the audit committee. And each year, the audit plan is developed in consultation with the audit committee with priorities that are based on the risk assessment process and lots of input from school board and staff. This is done by discussions throughout the year with APS directors and supervisors to kind of keep me aware of what exposures may exist for APS. Could be due to new activities or changes in activities. What are the things we have in place that help mitigate these exposures? And what is the risk of something not going as intended? Essentially, using the model we have in place, I kind of divide APS processes into 62 different areas. It could be instructional areas, academic areas, operational areas, financial areas, just kind of looking at the organization as a whole. And for each of those process areas, look at five factors. The quality and stability of the control environment. Things are going well. What's the chance they're going to continue to go well? A lot of this is based on, well, who's running it? Are there changes in key people who are doing that? What's the business exposure? Both the dollars as well as how quickly can those dollars disappear? How liquid are they? Also the public and political sensitivity in terms of if something were to go amiss, how conscious is the community going to be of that? Also, a lot of the activities we do have lots of compliance requirements, the federal, state, and county regulations. Do we have people in place who are aware of those who are proactively making sure we stay in compliance with those? And lastly, how well is the information we get? through our IT systems that let us know how well we're doing in each of those particular areas and how accurate is that so when management makes decisions, they have the best information available. Each year, we take a look at those process areas. We rank them into three priority groups. Most of the areas fall into the medium risk group. Some areas rank low, even though they're very important to APS, they just don't warrant as close attention as some of the higher risk areas. For recommendations for this year, Number one is comparing new school construction costs in Arlington with comparable school districts. Two is, again, continuing a three-year program and looking at activity revenues. This year, focusing on some of the smaller items, lease purchase funding, high school gate receipts, tuition, other districts, and any other miscellaneous fund that I haven't covered in prior years. Third project is reviewing school facility rentals. Fourth is reviewing APS assets that get assigned to our students. And lastly, to review the Medicaid annual cost report and payments received for school-based services. On that first area, new construction cost, uh, the board approved funding to hire an independent consultant to help us compare APS costs with comparable school districts, keeping in mind that we want to help we want the consultant to find a school districts that are comparable in terms of high level of achievement, high level of community and county requirements, and high level of sustainability. So we're comparing like with like. And uh, as director, I'm going to be working with APS staff to make sure we communicate and coordinate all these requirements, give them all of our information so they can complete this project in a, in a timely fashion. Second project, activity revenues. We want to document the processes that are in place that make sure we are, have accurate and complete revenues, examine whether there's any gaps in the process, and evaluate the overall level of insurance, and are we in compliance with all the laws that we should be. For school facility rentals, it's really looking at, I think when we look at other schools, I believe maybe when the last student and teacher goes home, things are locked up and secured overnight. That doesn't appear to be so at APS. There's so many other events going on, whether it's for instructional purposes, the PTA, other community activities, county expenses. I want to take a look at what's happening at all of our locations, both on the revenue side for any fees that we, and also on the expense, all the effort that it takes to set up, support, and clean up after each event to get the school back into pristine condition for the following day's classes and also reviewing all the expense allocations we may have with the county. With respect to APA assets assigned to students, looking at whatever may be given to a student, be it a textbook, be it an electronic device, how are those monitored, what happens when the student no longer needs the device, or they leave APS, how do we keep track of all that? 
In Medicaid re reimbursement, this was a project I started at the Audit Committee's request last year. Now that the annual cost report's being filed, I want to take time to kind of take a look at that and even better understand what payments are we receiving for the school-based services that we're getting reimbursed for. As far as follow-up on prior audits, um, when we had done a review of payroll, there were a lot of suggestions made, agreed to by management, a lot of changes were put into place. There's three areas where there's still work being done. One is we have very restricted access to human resources and payroll data, and our recommendations to even further restrict it specifically to, so people only have the data they actually need to perform their job. Second was to better improve the checks and balances when we have pay more, uh, pay or payroll and pay adjustments to make sure those have a good double check process and also that there's payroll output reports for review by principals and department heads in the area of financial controls at the schools when we did this project a year ago we know that a lot of schools had really great procedures we made a suggestion that those procedures be shared in a best practices manual that would be available for all the schools and that many schools were already using a lot of check scanning and online payment technologies and we were going to encourage more schools to have that available so that we're becoming more efficient on how we're uh, keeping track of things that happen at the schools and lastly to strengthen strategies for treasurer vacancies and absences in the area of design and construction financial controls when we did this review we looked at a lot of the great processes that are in place to make sure that when the board approves a big project that the communications that occur throughout the life cycle of the project are consistent with our policies and procedures and in the end the board is kept apprised of everything and every change that gets made according to their policies and while a lot of this is in writing we felt more of it needed to be put into writing in terms of all the specific things that people do to keep things on track within the finance department, within design and construction, and within purchasing to keep everything synchronized and smooth to make sure everything is done according to the way the board approved that. Are there any questions? Okay. Mr. Lander. Good evening, John. How are you, Mr. Nicholas? Great. Um, I always I served as liaison previously uh, uh, for the internal audit work and uh, one of the challenges I always uh, have is you're sort of a one-man army and so resources bandwidth uh, uh, time and how you best utilize your time is always something the board through the committee talks about with your work plan is there has there been conversation about how your work and the time uh, needed to complete some of the stuff, because as you said, some of the stuff is ongoing. How it is um, working as far as collaboration with the departments in which you're seeking to get information from. So um, uh, facilities, uh, how are you, with 14 different projects going on, how are you able to get folks to sit down with you and take time needed to work with you and explain things to you when they have so many other things going on. And I'm trying to find out through the audit committee, should the board look to create some type of balance so that you can get what you need, but that it doesn't necessarily um, uh, overexert the folks who are trying to prioritize all the other things that they have to get done. So that's my concern. And has the internal audit committee had that conversation about your interactions um, with the other departments that you're seeking to get information from? My experience has been when I've started these projects, you know, I start out with initial memo or phone call, and I try to set something up with the assistant superintendent at their convenience to kind of discuss what the objectives of the projects are and to get from them what interviews or people I may need to contact, what records I may need to review, and kind of set up a timeline that's going to work with their availability and whatever. I think a good example of that when I was asked by the Audit Committee to do the review of Medicaid reimbursement. There's just one Medicaid coordinator and they report to someone else and they were very cooperative in meeting with me, but I had lots of questions. 
they were very great at answering all my questions, but sometimes they were honest. They had to wait a week or two or three weeks to get back to me simply because they had other priorities. Right. And, and I think by communicating that, and there's respect on both ends, I've been able to do what I've been asked to do without disrupting the flow of information, which is very critical. Right. So when you have a timeline allocated for your work plan, do you or does the audit committee check and see if those timelines are uh, reasonable working with the different departments you need to interact with? If it's one person, then great. But as we talk about more involved processes and we talk about the uh, uh, reorganization going on uh, in the Department of Teaching and Learning and all the other things going on, the internal committee sits down and they work with you. It's been my experience, and we come up with a timeline what you seek to accomplish over the 10 months. But we never, in my experience, talk with the assistant superintendents. I guess that's when assistant superintendent for administration would come in. But getting feedback from the departments and the folks that you're seeking to interact with to see if that is a reasonable timeline. They may, they may need more time. Some of the processes that they're putting in place may not have taken effect yet. I'm just trying to get a feel for as we continue to be a, a, a growing school system, if how we utilize our internal auditor and your work plan, uh, ensuring that lines up with all the other people who, are, who you are dependent upon to get your work done. Anyone else? Uh, Ms. Van Doren. I just want to say thank you, Mr. McAvice. It, it's, uh, I served on the audit committee for, I think, one year, one year, and I learned a great deal, and I particularly appreciate the fact that you've um, stuck with the notion of doing this analysis of different costs from school system to school system for construction, because it's a question that we and the county board get on a regular basis, and we do have explanations, and we think we have good explanations, so I think this will be an excellent opportunity to look into that, and also uh, your diligence on Medicaid. Um, it's a very complex area. It's an area that a lot of school systems get in trouble with, so it's going to be very important for us to continue to have those controls, and I know we do, and I know we're in great shape, but I really appreciate that you've stayed on top of that and and I know that in my conversations with staff members who have been involved they've been very um, complimentary to to your ability to work closely with them and not overburden them so thank you for doing that yeah well, mr. Lander you know in response to your question I think what you're suggesting is a frequent occurrence especially in organizations that have so much going that have limited resources and people are expected to do a lot more with the same resources or if they have vacancies with less and it's really just a matter of communication and coordination and I'm hoping that I would get feedback from the assistant superintendents or from the or whomever if in fact they want me to scale back on something right. and so it, often I'm, maybe on my schedule I'll put it's going to take this time period November to December but realistically it probably extends further than that because I'm working on other things because the person I need information from just isn't available to interact with me, and I understand that. Right, and I guess uh, uh, the point that I think is, 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 is important for all of us to remember is when we set these expectations, this internal committee has an uh, assistant superintendent as a part of it and a superintendent so but the board as they receive feedback from this committee um, your work plan is now being developed and it is my hope moving forward that the superintendent and assistant superintendent for administration would as you said communicate to the other superintendents of what the expectations are if these timelines are not reasonable or not doable for any number of reasons that would be communicated to you prior to you going out to someone saying, hey, listen, I'm working on Medicare, I'm working on facilities, and I want to get this information, because then, you know, the horse has already left the barn, but <clears throat> if prior to that in developing the work plan, as it has been my experience, we take time to uh, 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 collaborate with our leaders of each 
department to ensure that what we're looking to get in your work plan, a reasonable time period is set up. Then that way, you're not frustrated the person who you show up doesn't know that you're not coming and these questions are gonna be asked. And as you said, when it's one person, it's really easy, but we're going through a reorg in the Department of uh, 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 Information, not Information System, uh, Teaching and Learning, and we will be having other departments that will be looking to realign uh, resources and, and people, and, and we have our staff doing uh, more work with less people or the same work with less people. Exactly. And, and that is what I'm concerned about because, uh, as I said, when I think about facilities, we have 14 different projects going on, and that is something when we start comparing other districts, as you said, there are not many Arlingtons. Uh, so, you know, uh, given the space and, and the amount of uh, land and money that we have, um, it's hard to compare us to other places. And so the time that you spend doing that ideally is time well spent for you, but I want to ensure that the folks who are uh, asked to, to spend their evenings with community meetings and BLPCs and all that other stuff are given proper notice and an opportunity to provide feedback to the board. So we're conscious of that because we wanna make sure that, um, you know, as I said, we don't overextend folks. So I appreciate it. Thank you. Mr. McAvice, we're gonna let Dr. Murphy comment. Thank you. Uh, I do wanna jump in here and um, kind of outline a few things kind of in relationship to Mr. Lander's question, but also, um, so that uh, there's clarity around Mr. McAvice's role. Mr. McAvice reports directly to the school board. He is a separate entity outside of the total organization and that brings objectivity um, to his work. I also think, Mr. Lander, some of the um, concerns that you have expressed is why we have uh, been, and Mr. Uh, Mikovice, I have to give him credit, is very deliberate and straightforward in his work. And I think um, he has been here now for a number of years. This was a new function that we brought into the organizational seven, uh, several years ago. And I think that there was um, some concern about that. And also, um, people were not really sure they understood his role. To his credit, and to also his background, how he's been able to um, you know, connect with the organization, bring improvements to the organization, and really identify uh, areas within the organization that we can strength, I think um, has been a, a large benefit to us. So I wanna make note of that. I also wanna make note of, um, you know, from a very simplistic standpoint, uh, what his role is, in that being that he provides information and the tools for correction to be brought about. Uh, and it's really the responsibility then of the, um, the job owner or the specific department owner to make those specific changes. And as you'll see noted, there are several follow-ups that Mr. McAvice has outlined in his plan so that there's this continuous monitoring going on. So I know that this is a, a priority for our community. That's why we brought this role on. And I also know that um, I believe the county government is also modeling or uh, paralleling some of the practices uh, that we have in place. And it really has to do with these high risk areas. And then finally, I'll just say that I think the plans that Mr. McAvice has brought forward from my um, you know, position have been reasonably timed out. We have had to come back, and that's the function of the audit committee to make slight adjustments. But my recollection, Mr. McVice, is you've not had to make whole scale changes with any of the plans that you had, and you've been able to achieve many of the timelines that you've outlined. So um, I think that's again to his credit and his background and his expertise. Mm -hmm. It's great work. Um, I had the chance on the on the committee this year to hear a more detailed report of what you're planning to do, and it, it's, it's really gonna be um, productive for us. I wanna thank you for adding the looking into the devices um, to your plan as well, because that is, that is also something we get asked by, about by the community and be very interesting. Uh, and I'm, I'm sure we're doing a great job, but um, we're interested to hear what you have to say on that. Um, if there are no further comments, thank you so much. And we will move on to our last agenda item. It is the Construction Contract Award for Early Work Package 2 for Fleet Elementary School. Dr. Murphy. I'm going to turn to uh, Mr. Jeff Chambers, who's waited patiently all evening to make <laughs> this final presentation. So, Mr. Chambers, it's, the floor is you. 
<clears throat> Good evening. Um, what I'm here uh, to bring information on is the uh, construction contract for package two at Fleet. This would be the second package, uh, early package, that we're looking for uh, at Fleet Elementary School. Um, this slide uh, is essentially a reminder for those who, who know what the process is with the CMR, as well as for those who may not know what the process is, and also to let everybody know that spell check does not always catch everything, even though you have the word uh, five times on one slide. Anyhow, construction manager at risk uh, is qualifications based selection um, and an alternative to competitive seal bidding. There's two parts to it. One is the pre-construction services, the other is construction services. Uh, the board did award Wh Whiting Turner the pre-construction services in uh, June of 2016. And the construction services is contingent upon reaching an agreed uh, maximum um, price. Uh, and, but there are early packages that can be released um, prior uh, to the agreed GMP uh, and, and I would say that um, the agreed GMP is expected later this year, uh, but we need to keep the project on schedule. Uh, this contract for early work for the GMP was um, done under the guidance provided by the Virginia Department of General Services and was uh, reviewed by the legal counsel. Um, you did approve the package one in June of 2017. Uh, which included activities associated with site work and excavation. This package two scope uh, was competitively bid among several contractors and includes concrete, uh, structural steel, uh, and foundation related trade packages. So it's basically everything uh, in the ground. We need to get the foundation in once the hole is dug, which is why we are, are here. Uh, package one, uh, which was approved, I won't review that, but package two is $11 million, $342,154. Uh, we are looking at an owner construction contingency uh, based on the percentages we typically use of $355,000 or a total of $11,677,154. And just as a reminder, this, this is the parking garage uh, underneath the school, so it's not a typical foundation, it's not a typical basement, uh, so it is, is a complicated uh, piece of the project. So the total would be um, $17,330,067 if you go with the recommendation for the package two. Um, our recommendations are to award the contract to complete the early work package to Whiting Turner in the amount of $11,342,154. Also to establish the package two owner construction contingency of $335,000. Um, and uh, increase the existing purchase order to include the added, val added contract value. Uh, both of the award and the contingency are incorporated in the current funding available by the school board, so no increases is, is necessary. Thank you very much. Um, I'm guessing there are no speakers. Just guessing. Uh, board colleagues, any uh, questions, comments? Compliments. Okay. We got at least one compliment, I'm sure, right? <laughs> Anyone? Um, you know, I, 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 Ms. Van Doren mentioned when, on the MCMM um, guys who were here, and you know, you were with us, I think, this morning mm -hmm. at uh, at Wilson, and um, boy, oh boy, I hope you are all eating well, <laughs> getting rest, and um, taking care of yourselves, because we've got a lot of stuff mm -hmm. we're building and designing and creating. It's great stuff. Um, we're really counting on it to happen on time and on budget. Yep. Um, we really, we don't tell you often enough. We, we recognize how hard you all are working. And, you know, we're always trying to think of our next question so we don't just tell you often enough how, how thankful we are for the great work you're doing. So thank there, you. I, I finally it. said it. Thank all you. right, thank you. Anything else? Um, any new business, board colleagues? <clears throat> Seeing none, this meeting is adjourned.